story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. possibility of rain before morning. Well, you gotta go with the odds. Well, it sure will ruin things for me. How's that? Because I've laid out a full day of yard work for tomorrow. Little odds and ends, you know, the kind you save up to do all at once. Save them for the next day. Oh, that's easy for you, Joe, living alone. You can change your plans on a moment's notice. Why can't you? When you've got a family, Joe, you gotta plan ahead. Everything has to be run on a tight schedule. Uh-huh. What time is roll call at your house? Oh, about seven. All right, Joe. Just wait till you stop living alone. Todd, I just came in from New York, Joe. Runaway boy. They think he's headed this way. Resembles female? Long hair, I guess. You know. Yeah. Sometimes you have to get around front to know which. If he needs a shave, it's probably a male. He won't be 14 until next month. Coming all the way out here by bus. Danny Meriton, 5'1", 93 pounds, black hair, brown eyes. Due to arrive tonight? Missing since Saturday, Joe. New York PD didn't turn up a lead until this afternoon. One of his friends got scared and told Danny's mother. She'll pay for a phone call. Who's light? Beck and Howard. You want to put in a call to them? The bus gets in at 6.30. Right. <laughs> Juvenile Friday. Yes, ma'am. Could you hold on a minute, please? Anything else, Dorothy? A situation at the main desk. I'll need some advice. Bill, you want to handle this? Pick up old five, will you? I got it. Yeah. A Spanish girl, Joe. Says she's 17, looks 15. From Costa Rica. Came up here to work as a maid in a private home. Yeah. Her name's Cotita. Speaks just enough English to answer the phone. The people she works for don't know any Spanish. Go on. Well, you can see how it might have happened. How what might have happened? She met a box boy at the neighborhood supermarket. His name's Cavado. They got married yesterday. Well, who's making the complaint? Cotita's employer. He says his contract with the foreign maid service makes him her guardian. Well, he's right. And that's what I told him. He wants to know how he can terminate the marriage. Well, he can petition for it. He's her guardian. He claims the Cavado boy is under age two, 20. Well, then it's fraudulent on both sides, but it's still a valid marriage. Not a thing we can do about it. Just him, huh? Yeah, if he moves fast enough. Oh? You said she's 17. Next year she'll be of age. You mean nobody can break it up then? Just themselves. <laughs> Juvenile Division Friday. Can I help you? Yes, sir. Well, how old is your son? Uh-huh. Where did the accident occur? No, sir, that wouldn't come through this office. No, sir, you'll have to check with Foothill Division. Yes, sir, you're welcome. You the watch commander? That's right, Jill Friday. Henderson, Central 1A6. Yeah, Henderson. What do I do with this? It's a baby. Yeah, I know, I've seen one. Just put it down. What do we got here, boy or girl? I don't know. How can you tell? Well, if it needs a shave, thanks. Where'd you get it? I found it in a restaurant. What restaurant? The Gold Rope over on East 9th. Just a little place, 6-8 booths. Doesn't do much dinner business. Partner and I took Code 7 there. The food's not bad. Anyway, there it was in the last booth. How'd it get there? Waitress says a woman came in with it. Sat and drank coffee for about an hour. Nobody paid much attention to her. Didn't see her leave. And that's all you got? Yes, sir. Nobody knows the woman. Only description we could get was she's kind of young, wearing a plastic raincoat. All right, Henderson, we'll take care of it. Cute little baby, isn't it? 
Any identification on it? No papers, no dog tags, and it's not an it, it's a he, a boy. Is that right? And he needs to be changed right now. Yeah, we're not equipped for that. Right here, Joe. You know what this is? You're the father? It's a diaper. Juvenile Friday. Yeah, babe. Abandoned? With one extra diaper and a ten rattle. Want to take over? Oh, no. Carry on, Officer Gannon. All right, Beck. Resume patrol and hit that depot again at 8.30. Right. Well, it's been a lot of years since my boys were that small. Let's see if I've lost the touch. Head back down to the bus station. Pick up the transient from New York? No, not yet. His bus ran into a sandstorm down near Indio. It'll be about two hours late. What are you going to do about the baby? Nothing until he gets finished. Do you think it's in good hands? I don't know. Let's see how he handles those safety pins. Never stuck one in 500 changings. You might like to watch this show. You never know. You might have to do it yourself someday. It looks simple enough, but there's little tricks to it. For instance, always put the far side pin in first. Like so. It's a new one on me. Now, when I pull the offside corner over... Mm-hmm, see that? I can get a nice snug fit. What happens if you go the other route? Well, then you aren't pulling across. You're pulling up. It's apt to roll the baby over on his face. When that happens, you might as well start all over again. Hate to admit it, Joe, but the man knows what he's talking about. One dry baby. Oh, I don't see how anyone could forget a baby. What'll I do about it, Joe? Book him under a 600B and then ship him over to McLaren Hall. The girls want to see him. I'll bring him back in a minute. Oh, money but me. Oh, money but me. What do you got here, Garowski? This is Prince George. That's all we could get out of him. No identification. We gave him his rights. All right, son, over here. Oh, money but me. found him over in MacArthur Park. He was trying to fly his kite. Not much wind for kite flying, but it all evened out. He didn't have a kite. Even so, he couldn't get much higher. But he blew a zero on the BA. He got an empty on him. Yeah, doctor says he's intoxicated, all right, but not alcohol. Possible drug ingestion. Looks like Reds, except he's belligerent. Was, anyway. He's coming in for a landing now. All right, son, what is it? Speed? Bennies? What are you on? Oh, my pardon What's that? It isn't Polish. Whatever it is, it's all he knows. It's a prayer, man. Like they say in Tibet, you know, Buddhism. No, I guess you wouldn't know. It's pretty deep stuff. Is that right? If you're interested, I'll try and explain it to you. Blowing out. That's what nirvana means. You, you got to get away out there, man. And, and you do it in stages. Attainments, we call them. What did you use to get way out there? Concentration. You got to fix on something. And then the mind will pass through the attainments until you reach it. I'll bet. Enlightenment. Uh, that's what we're all trying to reach, isn't it? Suppose you enlighten me with your name. I am Prince George. We'll go upstairs and start the paperwork. Right. Come on now, son. I want your real name and address. And what happens if I do? We call your parents. I don't think I want that. You want to get out of here, don't you? Wouldn't anybody? Well, there's just one way you're going to do it, with your parents. Now, in the middle of the night, or tomorrow morning. It's all up to you. George Fuller. 8224 Loretto Street. Phone number? 4831483. Father's name? William Fuller. All right, boy. Over here. Come on. Take your shoes off. Put your beats on the table. Why? We don't want you to mark on the walls. In here. What's this place? We call it a holding tank. It's air conditioned. Well, you can leave him here. We still got one empty holding tank. You better call McLaren and make the arrangements. Got a problem here, Sarge. All right, come on in. This is Sharon Mould at 1837 West Nile. All right, you want to sit down there, Sharon? Thank you. What's the problem? We took this call at Buxton. Do you know the department store? Yeah. Well, they sent us up to the women's wear section. The lingerie department, he means. That's right. A customer, Mrs. Nelson Stoner, claims her purse was clouded and Sharon was the only one that could have done it. It's a big lie. We'll hear your side of it in a minute. Go ahead, Raleigh. Mrs. Stoner was back in one of the changing rooms, trying something on. Well, she started out and then remembered she'd left her purse behind. Says she went right back, but it wasn't on the chair where she left it. Go on. Well, she looked around the changing room, found it on the floor. Only there wasn't any money in it now. How much was missing? About $230, Mrs. Stoner says. Why does she believe Sharon took it? When she turned back to get the purse, Sharon was just coming out of that area. The rest of the changing rooms were empty. She figured it couldn't be anybody else. You give Sharon her rights? Yes, sir, at the department store. Do you understand them, Sharon? Sure. All right, what about it? Whose baby is that out there at the desk? We don't know. It was abandoned. Can I look? Suppose we get your problem straightened out first. Now, did you steal that money? 
No, sir, I didn't. I never went near that changing room, and that's the truth. Has she been searched? Just her purse. Did you see anyone else who might have been able to get into that purse? No, but it's not fair. She said she had the money. I say I didn't take it. Why do you believe her? Maybe she's lying. Maybe she just spent it and didn't want her husband to know. Just because she's an adult, you take her word and call me a thief. It's not fair. Nobody's calling you a thief, Sharon. Mrs. Stoner reported the theft, and now we have to get to the bottom of it. Why don't you give me a lie detector test? I'm not afraid. You can ask me anything you like. Won't that prove I never touched the money? There's just one thing you have to prove. What's that? That you don't have the money now. sandwich and coffee. Well, I don't always order that. When's the last time you had something different? Well, who keeps track? I do. Five nights in a row. Ham sandwich and coffee. Ham sandwich and coffee. Ham sandwich and coffee. All right. Now, that truck doesn't have the greatest selection, you know. Face it, Joe. A bachelor just slips into a rut without ever noticing it. Is that so? Here's the proof right in front of me. Bill, do you want cottage cheese and pineapple with a glass of milk? Well, that's what I ordered. When? What? Well, when did you order that? Joe, you know I've got to order the same thing every night. I'm on a diet. Uh, oh, just listen at that. It's going to rain for sure. What'd you find? No money on it, Joe. I told you I never took it. I think she could pass a polygraph test on the money. Yeah. On the other hand. You were shoplifting, weren't you? But I didn't steal the money. Doesn't this prove it? Why? If I had the money, I would have bought this stuff instead of taking it, wouldn't I? It's stealing just the same. You know that, don't you? Yes, sir. Sharon is getting to be a young woman now, Joe. She says her mother doesn't seem to understand her. She still buys all my clothes, and it's all kid stuff. Well, now your mother's coming down to get you. Do you think it would do any good if policewoman Miller here had a talk with her? Would you please? Oh, thanks a lot. Could I see the baby now? Code 7 has arrived. Thanks, Jules. Here's our visitor from New York, Sarge. Your name Danny Meriton. You fit the description, boy. Says he doesn't have any identification. All right, take everything out of your pocket, son. Put it on the desk. He must have figured there'd be somebody to meet him. Came off the bus like a shot. Just reaching the door when I caught up to him. Got an arm around in front of him. If he'd made the street, we'd never have seen him again. Is that all the money you got? Yes, sir. Ten cents. When'd you tear this page out of here? I don't know. A long time ago. Because your name was on it? What's your New York address? 424 Rose Point Avenue. I'll send Danny up to 208 in a few minutes. Right. Don't feel too bad, kid. You're better off inside a night like this. Is it raining? Just started, but it's going to come down. 76% chance of it. When's the last time you ate, son? I don't remember. They'll give him a meal over to you in the hall. Yeah. Could you eat a ham sandwich now? Yes, sir. I sure could. Maybe I can find something to wash it down with. Why did you run away, son? My mother didn't want me around no longer. Is that right? She was going to have me put away. Don't you have a father? Sort of. You mean he doesn't live at home? Yes, that's right. Well, why didn't you go to him? What's the use? Nobody cares. Your mother wants us to phone her, and she's going to pay for the call. Sounds to me like she cares. Here you go, son. Boy, it's really pelting down. Wouldn't surprise me if it rained all night and all day. Have you ever been in trouble with the police in New York, son? No, sir. Where'd you get the money for your bus ticket? Saved it up. Cost quite a bit, didn't it? Half fair. I told him I was 11. How'd you figure to get along out here? Well, I've got a friend here. He used to live in New York. I was going to stay with him until I got a job. You'll be better off at home, son. No. Danny, your mother wants to talk to you. Oh, four, Joe. No, I don't know what to say. Just say hello. She'll pick it up from there. Hello? Yes, Mom. Yes, 
Yes, all right, Mrs. Meriden. Well, you'd better check the probation department. They'll assist in arranging transportation for Danny. In the meantime, he'll be looked after. Yes, ma'am. That's quite all right. Yes, ma'am. Goodbye. Sounds like he's going home. Yeah. I'll take him up to 208. Couldn't I stay with my friend till the ticket comes? Afraid not, son, but you'll be all right over Juvenile Hall. Oh, it's not that. It's just all I got to see of L.A. was a bus station and some rainy streets. Come on, son. All right, if I take my salary? Sure. How about your milk? Thanks. Yeah, Dorothy, what is it? George's parents are here. All right, send them in. Maybe I ought to warn you. What's that? They're looking to bite somebody. Look here, Sergeant. I don't want to be unpleasant about this, but I'd like to talk to somebody a little higher than a sergeant. I'm sorry, sir, for tonight. That's as high as it goes. Who's the head of this department? Captain Morris. He'll be here in the morning when you come back. When we come back? Yes, sir. You'll have to bring your boy back down here tomorrow. Well, why can't we wrap it all up now? Well, if for no other reason, your son's condition. His condition? What do you mean his condition? Was he injured? No, sir. Well, I told you... You said he was picked up for joyriding. Was he drinking, too? Is that it? The boy's a little high? More than a little, Mr. Fuller, but not from drinking. I didn't know how to tell you. I just couldn't believe it. George has never done anything like this before. I was sure somebody had made a mistake. Yes, ma'am, your son. Has he been using narcotics? Drugs, Mr. Fuller. Dangerous drugs. There's a big difference. Where is he? I'd like to hear that from him. Right here. You sure it's not liquor? The arresting officers gave him a breathalyzer test. There was no alcohol content. <laughs> All right, put your shoes on. Hey, can I take my beads? All right. Oh, Mom, they don't feel good. You can take them home now. No chance. You keep them. He's no son of mine. Oh, Will, you don't mean that. Well, look at him. Just look at him. How many times have I told him to cut his hair? How many times have I told him to get rid of those feminine beads and start looking like a man? How many times have I told him to stop wearing those asinine monkey suits and start dressing like a man? Well, this is the end of the line. Maybe he can go to jail like a man. Either you take him home or he'll be transferred to juvenile hall. I don't care where you send him. You never did care. I cared enough to try to raise you like a man. Now I'm through caring. What did you expect me to be? A 300 hitter or a star fullback? All right, that's enough of that. Now, Mr. Fuller, your son has no previous record. He's not an addict or a criminal. He is in trouble, but it's the kind of trouble that can be cured. It's been coming for some time, and either you didn't recognize it or you weren't looking for it. When it started or why, I don't know. It's not my job to know it's yours. You're his father. That's a position you can't resign from. You can walk away from it, but it'll always be an unfinished job with your name on it. Now, do you want him to spend the night in juvenile hall, or do you want to take him home with you? Tomorrow you get a haircut and those beads come off. Yes, sir. Now, this doesn't mean I buy your spiel, Sergeant. Parents aren't always wrong and never 100%. No, sir. I didn't say they were. Even if I missed a trick along the way, George is 15. He's big enough to carry his weight. Well, sir, I guess maybe it's a partnership. It ought to be anyway. Yes, sir. And you're the senior member of the firm. here who'd like to go home. Any missing baby reports yet? Nope. He's all set to leave for McLaren. Yeah, well, so long, young fella. Such a cute little thing. Yeah, they all are. I don't know how anybody could resist him. How about his mother? p.m. The night watch remained quiet, probably due to the heavy rain. No curfew violations had been reported. Yes, ma'am. Something we can do for you? They said to come in here. All right. Come on in. Sergeant Friday, he'll help you, Miss... Uh... Brenner. Mrs. Patrick Brenner. Would you like to sit down, Miss Brenner? Thank you. Nobody I could turn to. Nobody to lean on. Patrick says that's always been my trouble. If I didn't have someone to lean on, I'd fall. I guess that's what happened tonight. I beg your pardon? When Patrick walked away, I started to fall. And there wasn't anything to catch me. Just a great, big, empty nothing. Have you ever had a falling dream? You know, when you just keep falling and falling forever because there's no bottom to anything? That's the way I felt tonight. Yes, ma'am. Of course, you always wake up and find out it's just a bad dream. Maybe it was the rain that woke me. I was walking along a street I'd never been on before, and my feet were wet. And all at once I remembered Christopher. 
Christopher? I lost him. At first, I couldn't remember where or how. Then it started coming back to me. I stood there and thought, and then I remembered where he was. I went right back. I'm sure it was the same place, but I was too late. It was locked up. Mrs. Brenner, how old is Christopher? Seven and a half months. This place where you left him was at a restaurant? Yes, the Golden Rope, but it's closed for the night. He wouldn't still be in there all alone. No, ma'am, your baby's safe. He was brought here by some officers. I never meant to lose him. But he was so little and I didn't want him to fall with me. Can I please have my baby now? No, not tonight, I'm afraid. Why? Well, for one reason, he's not here any longer. Where is he? He was taken over to McLaren Hall. That's where abandoned babies are kept until the court makes a decision. What should I do now? You ought to go home, Mrs. Brennan. Get out of those wet clothes. You can catch pneumonia. How will I know about my baby? We'll take your name and address, and an investigator will contact you. Then you'll give Christopher back to me? We don't have anything to say about that, Miss Brenner. It's up to the court. The baby may be returned to you or his father, or he may be made a ward of the court. You mean Christopher could be put in a foster home? It's possible, Mrs. Brenner. But that would be all wrong. I'm his mother. Yes, ma'am. Now, if we could have your name and address. I gave it to them out at the desk. All right. I'm telling you the truth. I just felt I needed somebody to lean on. Well, your baby's seven and a half months old. Yes. He needs someone to lean on, too. stayed home. Well, there goes tomorrow. What? The rain, Joe. It's coming straight down. Cannon had the day all planned. Oh, washed out now. Oh, I don't know. It might clear before morning. Won't make any difference. You can't do yard work when it's muddy. I see. Well, there's one thing you can say about rain. And what is that? A little of it falls on everybody. Yes, ma'am. How old is the boy, ma'am? Fifteen. Uh-huh. And your last son, how old The story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On March 20th, a hearing was held in Juvenile Court, State of California, Los Angeles County Judicial District. In a moment, the results of that hearing. It's a good, healthy way to enjoy life. Some people like living dangerously. When they hurt others, I go to work. I carry a badge. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Well, they're 
interested, but the idea of a police career meets a lot of resistance. Especially among the ethnic groups. It's understandable to some we're asking them to join the establishment, the other side. Well, intellectually, most of them know it's really their side as well. Instinctively, that's another matter. A lot of them worry, too, about what their friends would say if they joined. I don't need to tell you how badly the department wants and needs recruits, particularly from the ethnic groups. No, sir. We want more Mexican-Americans, more Orientals, and more Negroes. Well, we're going to talk to them again. Talk may not be enough. Find a way to reach them. Well, I think we have. Officer Dave Evans, he's working patrol. They know him and they like him. He's sort of a hero to them. All-star athlete in the city school system. Played for the Pittsburgh Steelers for a while. I'd like to ask him to come with us next time. Good idea. Go ahead. Yes, sir. But if that doesn't work, find something that will. Those fellows are more important than they know. How is that? If they join, others will follow. spent the afternoon talking to some servicemen who were due for discharge about joining the department. We drove back to the police building. We wanted to talk to Officer Dave Evans as he came off day watch. We met him in the locker room in the basement of the police building. Sir, Bill, Dave, how's it going? Routine, you know, family dispute, traffic offense, couple of hot rollers. We heard you had a 211 yesterday. Liquor store, parked the car in the alley, panicked when the delivery truck blocked their exit. Tried to make it on foot. That's when we got there. They ran right into us. Forgot to mention they were armed. Yeah, but they didn't use them. We heard you knew one of them. Grew up in the same neighborhood. Never thought I'd have to bust him. Shame he didn't do what you did years ago. What's that? Join the department. He wasn't interested. He might have been if somebody had talked to him. You're both recruiting detail, aren't you? You're after something. Well, you've heard of the East L.A. Graduates Union. Yeah, they meet in high school after, don't they? It's a vocational guidance kind of thing. They bring in people to talk about job opportunities to kids who have already graduated. That's right. We've been meeting with them. I heard that. I know some of those kids. Uh Uh-huh. That's why we'd like you to give us a hand by speaking to them. Me? Oh, come on, Sarge. I'm no public speaker. You won't have to make a speech. Joe does that. You'll just answer questions, level with them, tell it like it is. Some of them have just been bumming around since they left school, you know, working at odd jobs, getting nowhere. We tried talking to them, but we can't seem to reach them. They listen to you, Dave. Look, fellas, I'm a patrolman. I'd like to help, but, you know... Could make a big difference. We'd appreciate it if you would. I don't know. More important, they might appreciate it in the long run. How's that? Everyone you help straighten out now, you might not have to handcuff later on. Monday, July 22nd, 8.40 p.m. We attended the weekly meeting of the East L.A. Graduates Union. As arranged, Bill and I were there to tell them more about a police career. The word had gotten around that this time Officer Dave Evans would be there with us. A would-be recruit has to pass five exams to join the department. Written exam, oral, medical, a personality evaluation test, and an agility test. Now, if he passes all five, he then enters the police academy, where he alternates periods of actual field work with sessions dealing with such things as patrol tactics, law, self-defense, the use of firearms, and so on. Then, after he's been a policeman for one year, he can specialize if he wants to. Now, there are more than 250 job opportunities in the department, and if you qualify, you can apply for any one of them. Forgery, homicide, motorcycle patrol, narcotics, scientific investigation, and a great many others. Now, one more thing. Why you should join. I won't talk about the contribution you'd make to society as a policeman. I won't mention the satisfaction you'd receive helping your fellow men of being a vital, important, active member of your community. Maybe those things are important to you, maybe they're not. That's for you to decide. But if you are interested in a job with a future that's exciting and far from routine, a career that offers unlimited opportunities as well as guaranteed security, I sincerely suggest you consider joining the department. Now, since you men probably have a lot of questions, I want to ask Officer Dave Evans here to answer them for you. Dave? This is something new for me. Most of the time I ask the questions. Like, where's your driver's license? Or what are you doing with those cigarette papers? All right, who's got the first question? Me, man. I got a real good one for you. How much bread do you Irvines make? What kind of money? Well, as soon as a recruit enters the police academy, he starts at 715 a month and gets an automatic raise for the next three years and then is eligible to take the promotional exam. Hey, man. Some of those big factors pay more than that to start, don't they? That's right. Sometimes they do. And that's one of the reasons we have trouble getting recruits. But if all you're interested in is money, we don't want you anyway. We're offering you a career, not just a job. 
What about those amendments that were just passed by the people? You know, Proposition A? I saw some of that money they voted the police department and higher wages. Not the money from Proposition A. That goes for better facilities, better equipment, better working conditions. But under the other propositions the public passed at the same time, yes, it's true, we get paid for overtime. Hey, man, just like they do in those factories. Will you tell us again some of the qualifications we need to join? Well, you've got to be a high school graduate, and you've got to pass the department's exams. I got a question. Are the exams tough? They aren't easy, but all of you here ought to be able to pass them. And if you were in the upper quarter of your class in school, you won't have any trouble at all. I got a real serious question for you this time. All right. If I join the fuzz, does that mean I dodge the draft? No, it does not. You got to serve your time like anybody else. You don't get any special privileges being a policeman. Man, you ain't got nothing going for you at all, have you? I've got a question. Would you tell us why you became a policeman? Why? Well, there are a couple of reasons. First of all, I always liked the idea, even as a kid. Later on, when I started thinking about what I was going to do with my life, well, this might sound a little phony, but I wanted to do something for my country. I remember when we studied civics in school, they told us the police department was a local arm of the government, and that's just what it is. The laws may be made in the state capital, or decisions handed down by the Supreme Court, but it's a police officer who sees to it that those laws have real meaning, some real use. I figured that was just about as important a job as a man could have. And there was another reason I became a policeman, too. I wanted to do something for my own people. And I figured if I was a part of the law, I could do that as well. And I'll tell you something else. Some of our people talk about white man's law. There's no such thing. Not when black men like you and me wear this uniform. It's everybody's law. What about all those jobs Sergeant Friday mentioned? Which one would be best for a Negro? Any one of them. If you've got the qualifications, you can apply for whichever one you want. There's no segregation or favoritism in the department. Does that mean I'd have as much chance of getting promoted as a white man? That's just what it means. Promotions are based on results of exams, and your chances of getting good grades are as good as anybody's. Hey, I got a question for you, officer. If all that equal opportunity jazz is true, how come you're only a patrolman and he's a sergeant? If you were as smart as you act, you would know it's because he's been a policeman a lot longer than I have. You expect us to believe that, do you? I do, yes, because it's true. That's what you say, Uncle Tom. That's exactly what I say, and that's what I expect you to believe. And I'll tell you why. Because even now, when we have only around 250 Negroes in the department, 24 are sergeants and 5 are lieutenants. And if you don't think that's enough, you can drag off that chair and do something about it right now. Yeah, and what is that? Join the department. July 23rd, 8.30 a.m. I checked in with Lieutenant Ed Henry and reported the progress of the previous evening's meeting. Then he was able to reach them? He was. Good. There were a few rough moments, but he handled them just right. What happened? Hecklers? That's right. One in particular. He did everything he could to throw Evans. His name's Alec Harper. What about the others? They knew he was leveling with them. They like him, and they trust him. Then they'll follow his lead? Good chance. What's your next move? Well, I thought I'd give them the rest of the week to digest what they've learned. All right, but don't let them lose interest. You don't have to worry about that. We'll hear from him. That's fine. I'm afraid we'll hear from Alec Harper, too. Friday, July 26th, 8.30 a.m. Bell and I checked in for work. We were scheduled to discuss our recruiting program with the Junior Chamber of Commerce that morning, so I cleaned up some paperwork before we left. Joe, when were you born? April 2nd, why? Astrology. Astrology? You know, the zodiac, horoscopes, mystic powers of celestial bodies. Boy, there's some real good stuff in here. Sure there must be. Ah, April 2nd, Aries, sign of the old ram. Mars favors Uranus. Jupiter moves in on Leo. Boy, look at that. Joe, you know what? No, what? This is your lucky day. Listen to this. Wise investments will pay large dividends. Think of that. Decisions made today will invariably prove wise. Think of that. Influence at its zenith. You realize what that means, Joe? What what means? Influence at its zenith. Come on, come on, we got work to do. See, you influenced me already. Three days had passed since our second meeting with the East L.A. Graduates Union. It was time for a follow-up. We decided to check back with one of the young men who was at the last meeting. He worked at a neighborhood car wash. Hi, 
my source. What's the matter? Doesn't the LAPD polish his own cars? You do a nice job. I'll have to bring my own car in here. Better make it soon. This is just a fill-in job. I'm looking for something better. Well, the other night you seemed interested in joining the department. Yeah, some of us were interested for a while. What do you mean for a while? We thought about it a lot. We figured if it was okay for Dave Evans, it was okay for us. Yeah. We figured he'd level with us. No, come on. Straight stuff, you know. That's right. So we were all set to take your exams. That was before. Before what? Before we found out Dave was just trying to sell us a bill of goods. How's that? Oh, come on, you know. Tell us. Come on, the word's out. What word? Dave Evans. He turned in his resignation. recruits. 
Not only that, we need Evans. He completes his fourth year in the department next month. That means he could take the sergeant's exams. That's right. And he'd make a good sergeant, wouldn't he? He couldn't have forgotten. He hasn't. I saw him when he came in for night watch. He says he's not interested. He's depressed, discouraged. We all get fed up once in a while, but he's overreacting. It's been building up for some time now. Those broken windows just triggered it. I figure it's something he's got to work out for himself, and he needs time for that. A leave of absence might help. Uh, it's no good, Joe. Well, the captain would go for it. He would, but Evans won't. I already suggested it to him. He'll have to think of something else. And soon. Yes, sir. Before those fellows lose interest. It says in here the sun has exerted an influence over our lives that science has completely ignored for centuries. Does it say why it's ignored it for so long? Oh, I haven't gotten to that yet. Have a candy bar. No, thanks. Go ahead, you look hungry. I'm not. Yes, you are. Oh, Joe, I've got to pull the lever. Well, sir, what do you think of astrology now? Your horoscope was right all the way, wasn't it? Was it? Well, sure, it said wise investments will pay large dividends. scheduled to talk about recruiting to a citizen civic committee that evening. Since the meeting wasn't until nine, we decided to have an early dinner. We headed for a restaurant a block away from the meeting place. Any unit in the vicinity of the 800 block Grand Avenue, citizen reports an officer in need of assistance. We're two blocks away. All right, lean on it. Six, eight. 
I gotta thank you. Really thank you. A year ago, my store was smashed by a fight like that. Only then there wasn't a policeman like you around. I can't tell you how much I appreciate what you just did. I really appreciate it. The way you stopped that fight, the way you handled that crowd. I'm gonna write your captain. I'm gonna tell him how thankful we are. No, sir, that's really not necessary. <laughs> it's necessary to us. Now, that badge number was 4868, wasn't it? Yes, that's what it was. Dave, remember those examples you wanted a couple of hours ago? Yeah. Well, you've got a couple of good ones right here, haven't you? I guess I have. Say, we've got to have your captain's name. We're going to address this letter to him personally. And everybody in the neighborhood is going to sign it. That's really not necessary. Oh, yes, it is. It is to us. Let's come right along. Pretty smart, aren't you? How's that? Letting Dave handle that fight alone. A wise decision, Joe. If you say so. You'll have to admit now there's a lot more to astrology than you thought. What do you mean? Well, your horoscope. Remember what it said? Huh? Decisions made today will invariably prove wise. The story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. During the remainder of that summer, several members of the East L.A. Graduates Union took the police department's applicants' examinations. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Wednesday, July 30th. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch at the hospital detail out of detective headquarters. The boss is Captain Didion. My partner's Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. Among the duties of the hospital detail is the preliminary investigation of all police problems involving the mentally ill, amnesia victims, and alcoholics. 5.15 p.m. We received a phone call from Homicide asking us to check the files for a Fred W. Pick. He was believed to be mentally disturbed. He had written a letter threatening to blow up a local radio station. Yeah, that's right, Danny. Uh huh. Yeah, well, our records go back five years. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we. Yeah, we got them on file. Yeah, that's right. What's that, Danny? Oh, we got it right here. Yeah, here you go. Pick Frederick Waller. Psychopathic examination requested two years ago. He was 38 at the time. 38. Uh huh. Violence involved. Beat up his brother for trying to get him deported as an undesirable alien. Yeah. No, I wouldn't think so. Both brothers were born in Montana. Yeah. We'll do that. Uh huh. Okay, Danny. Right, boy. Bye. Did you ever hear of Eric Shafton, some guy on the radio? Sure. It's a talk show. You know, people phone in while he's on the air and make a beef. Oh, what about? Well, anything, Joe. Whatever happens to bug you, that's what you talk about. What does a Shafton do? Depends. Sometimes he agrees with the caller. Other times he sets them straight. Disconnected. Where's the upside down book? Bottom left. Surprised you never listened to Shafton, Joe. There's two or three other talk shows around, but for my money, he's the best. Why? Does he get results? Well, no, he doesn't do anything except talk. Well, then? I guess it just gives you a chance to unload. You know how it is. You got a beef, you tell it to somebody, and you feel better. Didn't work that way with Fred Peck. He called Shafton, huh? The radio station. Now, he didn't get on the air. His beef was that Shafton had been talking about him every night. He wanted it stopped. Yeah. Station manager checked it out. Shafton says he never heard of Peck. Never used his name. Mm-hmm. That was two nights ago. Last night, they got another call. Final warning. Shafton does it again tonight. Pick will put him off the air. How's he figure to do that? With a gun. 5.28 p.m. We contacted Fred's mother, Mrs. Joseph Pick. She told us her son had left the house shortly after lunch to visit a friend in the Hollywood area. We obtained the name of the friend, Terry Welkin, and his phone number. After some hesitation, Mrs. Pick admitted that Fred had not been taking his medication and appeared somewhat disturbed, though not alarmingly so. 5.35 p.m. We phoned Terry Welkin. Mr. Welkin? 
This is Officer Gannon at Central Receiving Hospital. No, sir, nothing like that. We're just trying to locate Fred Pick. Fred Pick? I see. Mm-hmm. Well, did he seem all right? Well, now, you're an old friend of his, aren't you? Mr. Welkin, do you possess a gun of any kind? No, sir, do you own a gun? Well, all I'd like to know is if Fred wanted to borrow it, wanted to borrow your gun. Well, would you mind checking it anyway? Yes, sir, right now. Yeah, I'll well, hang on. Fred was there until about 4 o'clock, didn't say where he was going next. Yeah. Welkin said he was uptight, talked all the time, but nothing irrational. What kind of gun does Welkin own? 32. Yes, sir. I see. All right, Mr. Welkin, thank you for the help. Pardon? Well, that's hard to say. I'd only be guessing. Yes, sir. Goodbye, Mr. Welkin. Gun's gone, huh? 32 automatic, fully loaded. Yeah. Welkin doesn't think there's anything to worry about. He doesn't, huh? Admits Fred's a little strange, but claims he wouldn't kill a fly. Yeah, well, you don't kill flies with a 32 automatic. 5.40 p.m., the radio car in the area was dispatched to the Pick home to watch Fred and to obtain a complete description of him. This description was relayed to Hollywood Division, which dispatched a car to the radio station. Right. Sergeant Friday? Yeah, that's right. Quinn, 2L47? Yeah, Quinn. We got an old gentleman out here. Don't quite know what to do with him. What's the problem? Well, he's been in the lobby of the Biltmore Hotel since 8 o'clock this morning. Maybe earlier than that. But 8 o'clock's when somebody first remembers noticing him. He's noticeable. Just sitting there. Yes, yeah, sir. Didn't cause any trouble. But he'd been there over nine hours when the house man talked to him. You said he was noticeable? Yeah, he stands out even in a crowded lobby. When he talks, you think you're in the south of England. Is his name Jennings? I don't know. Neither does he. And he doesn't have any ID. At first, we thought he could show us where he lived. We drove him around for 20 minutes, but he didn't recognize anything. Okay. Bring him in. Mike. Officer Boyd. Sergeant Friday. Officer Gannon. Sit right down there, sir. This is the man I was telling you about. Hello there, Mr. Jennings. That's your name, isn't it? Basil Jennings? Is it? I really couldn't say. That's what it was the last time you were in here. I have no recollection of ever having been here before. However, I shall not dispute your word. You're a sitter, aren't you, Mr. Jennings? Huh? But it wasn't the Biltmore last time. The Sheridan, wasn't it? You have the advantage of me, sir. You still live at that board and care place over on South Union, do you? My address eludes me for the moment. I'm sure the constable here can verify that. Uh-huh. Bill, Quinn. Did you search him? Yes, yeah, sir. He's got 43 cents in his pocket and nothing else. It's Basil, all right, Joe. No doubt about that. Do you think he's faking? Well, maybe he had a slight stroke. That'll affect the memory, and he's the right age bracket for it. Better have Dr. Mackin take a look at him, huh? Right. You've had him before, huh? Oh, yeah. He's a regular. He sits around all the big hotel lobbies 12, 15 hours a day. When I ask him what he's doing there, he blows his stack and ends up here. <laughs> all right, Mr. Jennings, let's take a little walk. Where? Where are you taking me? I demand to know. We're going to have the doctor look you over, and if you're all right, you can go on home. How's that? Oh, very well, then. Sergeant, I do not require medical attention. I'm at the peak of health. You remember him, Bradley, the lobby sitter. Oh, yes. Good afternoon, Mr. Jennings. Good afternoon. How are you today? Oh, I'm fine, fine, just like I've been telling you. Your cotton vest off, please. Madam, I am not wearing a vest. Well, if you are, it comes off. We're going to take your blood pressure. Young... All right, I can manage it. Young lady, I've been dressing myself unaided for three quarters of a century, and I shall continue to do so for some time to come. Good for you. Come on, don't be modest. Roll up your left sleeve. All right, leave me alone. I can do it. I've done it before. Now, how did that get way up there, do you suppose? I have no idea, sir. Basil R. Jennings, Seven Palms Rest Home, blood type AB. Had you fooled for a while, didn't I? Now, why would you do a thing like that? First of the month. How's that? First of the month. Pension checks just came in. Of course, the home always takes most of that, but there's nine dollars left over, so I have my little outing. You do? Hotel lobbies, the most fascinating places in the world. Railroad stations used to be. 
Blood pressure's fine. No, if you want to observe life, Sergeant, a hotel lobby is the place. Splendid drama. Every person you see is a story in himself. There's nothing wrong with your memory, is there? Put one over on the young man, didn't I? <laughs> Topped the day off with a ride in a police car. Very exciting. I enjoyed it enormously. All right for Mr. Jennings to go home, Doc? Don't know why not. I'll call the rest home and have him come and get you. You're not mad at me, are you? No, not too mad. Thank you very much, Sergeant. See you the first of next month. <laughs> Six fifty-five p.m. In another five minutes, the Eric Shafton talk show would be on the air. The black and white from Hollywood Division was standing by at the radio station. There had been no further report on Fred Pick. What's the matter? Lose something? No, nope, caught something. What? Still too early to tell. Only started this afternoon. Itchy sensation, rash across the chest. Could be several things: prickly heat, measles, scarlatina. Well, didn't you have measles when you were a kid? Yeah, I had the measles, Joe. German measles. Rubella, that's the medical term, but you can get it again, you know. Is that right? Absolutely. Don't let anybody tell you once you've had them, that's it. You can get it as often as it comes around. Well, are the German measles going around? Well, no, not that I've heard of, Joe. Well, then? That doesn't prove anything, Joe. These things have got to start someplace, don't they? Yeah, I guess so. On the other hand, it could be poison oak, except I haven't been around any of that. Well, now, you were just talking to Doc Mack, and why didn't you ask him? Well, Joe, all he could tell me at this stage is I have a rash. I already know that. Joe. Yeah? Tell me something. Anything. Now, be honest with me. I'll try. How long have you been working hospital detail? Well, now, you ought to know that. We've been together. I know, but how many years has it been? Three. Three years. In other words, 36 months. That's the way it figures. In 36 months, haven't you picked up anything about medicine? Can somebody please help me? Yes, sir. What's your problem? I've got a woman out in the car. She's sick. Where is your car? It's out there by the ramp. Doc, sick woman in the car. Would you take a look? Your name, please? Brownlee, L-E-A. First name? Uh, George Brownlee. Address? 3942 and a half South 10th Street. Come on, she's passed out or something. She, anyway, she won't budge. Patient's name, please. I don't know. Well, it's your car, isn't it? Yeah, I hold a pink slip on it. Then what's a strange woman doing in it? I guess that seems kind of funny, don't it? Yeah, it does to me. What happened to this woman? This man says she passed out in his car. Passed out? I guess she's dead, huh? She has been for a long time. Is that a fact? Rigor mortis has set in. examination of the dead woman indicated she had died at least three hours earlier. Cause of death was unknown. 7.15 p.m. We took George Brownlee into room five to get a statement. All right, Brownlee, you want to tell us about it? Yes, sir. Start any time. I found her in the park. MacArthur Park, you know? Yeah. She was lying there in the grass. Hardly more than looked at her to start with. I figured she was there for the same reason all of us was, to find a breath of air. Sure it was a hot day. Okay, Brownlee, you saw her lying in the park. Yes, sir, and that's a fact. And I seen these kids, too. Must have been four or five of them. Looked about 16, 17 years old. Big enough to do you a lot of mischief if that's what they had in mind. And the way they was acting, I figured there was going to be trouble. Go on. Well, I went over and I told her. I said, Miss, you better get yourself out of this park, because whatever these kids are planning, it ain't going to be good for you. What time was that? Time? I couldn't honestly tell you that. Like maybe 3, 3.30, long in there. Was she alive then? Of course she was, man. She talked to me. Said she was ready to leave the park, but didn't think her legs was up to it. She'd been hitting the bottle real good. Go ahead. Well, I, I had nothing better to do, so I told her I'd drive her home. Got her in the car, but she passed out before she could tell me where to go. No, she didn't pass out, Brownlee. She died. Yes, sir, she did. I realize that now. Hospital detail, Friday. Uh-huh. Yes, sir, that's right. I see. Was there any trouble? No, sir. That's the right procedure. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Watch commander at Hollywood Division. Yeah? Fred Pick. They collared him at the radio station. They're bringing him over here. What about the gun? In his pocket. He never got to use it. Good. 
Brownlee, you spell that L E A? Yes, sir. I'll call R and I. She running a make on me. That's right. Guess there ain't no cause to hold back then. I got me a record. Burglary, two to five. I'm on parole. All right, now do you want to make any changes in that story of yours? Might as well, I guess. Esther Lee Mayhew, that was her name. We was keeping company eight, nine months now. Met her the first week I got back from Vacaville. She was working in a bar then, but she had a problem. What kind of problem? Bring up the profits, man. She was a lush. Ain't no softer way of putting it. Just drank herself into an early grave. 34 years old. How'd it happen, George? Maybe she got some bad booze. I don't know. We was up in the room, and all of a sudden she said, Lover, I don't feel good. Down she went. I tried to bring her around, but nothing happened, and I figured to get her to emergency here. We didn't make it. Yeah. She died right beside me in the car. Just gave a little gurgle, and I knew emergency would do her no good. I just drove her around. I don't know how long, three, four hours, maybe. Didn't seem to be no hurry. Sorry about that crud I give you first, finding her in the park, you know? Yeah. Dead woman in the car, me with a record. I figure it's got to bust my parole. Why'd you come here, George? Huh? Well, you could have put her in the park and driven away. No, sir, I couldn't have. I couldn't leave her in no park. Even if I got to go back to Vacaville, I couldn't have done that to her. We'll have to hold you until it's checked out. If she died of natural causes... She didn't. What's that? Somewhere along the line, she got hurt. You don't drink like she did, except as a painkiller. She never told me what it was. I never asked her. Yeah. I guess she died. Because it hurt too much to live. Eight ten p.m., the radio unit from Hollywood Division arrived with Fred Pick. He appeared calm. The arresting officer said he had freely admitted his identity and surrendered the gun without resistance. He remembered Bill and me. Well, hello there, Fred. How you doing? Fine, fine. No problem. Do we need the cuffs? Up to you, Sergeant. Let's take them off and talk a while. Fine, fine. No problem. Sit down. You want me to sit down? Yeah. Might as well. Can't stay very long, though. It's the old lady. You know, she gets worried if I'm out after dark. Yeah, we know. How have you been, Joe? You're looking very well. So do you, Bill. Feeling all right? Generally pretty good. Fred, now what's all this business with you and this Eric Shafton, the fellow on the radio? Oh, that. Well, don't worry about it, Joe. Just a misunderstanding. Nothing that can't be straightened out if he'll stop talking about me. I don't think that's asking too much, is it? He doesn't have any right to use my name on the air. That's a violation of my constitutional rights. You know that as well as I do, Joe, Bill. I don't like being violated any more than anybody else. And I know that I'm on solid ground there. I've taken it all the way to the Supreme Court. And they agree with me all down the line. Fred, I think I'm going to send you back to see your doctor, OK? A Camarillo? You ought to like it up there. It's nice grounds, a lot of fresh air. The place isn't too bad, but I don't like those shock treatments. Well, I hear they don't give shock treatment so much anymore. They're using medication now. Is that right, Joe? A patient can refuse shock treatment. Now, it says so right here in the new Mental Health Act. And this is signed by the governor. Well, that's all right, then. I'll go. I think you made a wise decision, Fred. Oh, you're a good man, Joe. I appreciate everything you've done for me. Now, I'd like to do a little something for you. No, oh, no, that's all right, Fred. No, 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 no. It's something I want to do. Now, just let me borrow a pencil and a piece of paper. Thank you. This will only take a minute. Of course, I'm going to keep some for myself. <laughs> sure, that's only fair. You just give this to my lawyer, and he'll take care of all of the details. It's legal, you know. This is not as good as I did for you the last time, but things have been a little tough. I understand, Fred. Thanks. Any time. Good old Fred. Last time he gave you that uranium mine, wasn't it? Yeah, Fred's generous, all right. What is it this time? <laughs> Seven million dollars in stocks and bonds. Don't spend it all in one place. Hospital detail, Gannon. Right. What's his condition? We'll do what we can. Wilshire Division, shooting coming in, code three. Yeah. Victim's got five bullets in him. Doesn't look like he's gonna make it. Uh -huh. Wilshire detectives want a dying declaration. When a person in imminent fear of death makes a voluntary statement, 
the legal presumption is that he has told the truth. This statement is no longer considered hearsay, but is legally admissible as evidence in court. 11.40 p.m., the ambulance from Wilshire Division arrived. Room one. both arms. if we can. You're John Murphy, are you? Yeah. Sergeant Friday, John, how do you feel? Real bad. I'm not gonna make it. We can get a priest. No, don't bother. Somebody you want notified? Are you married, John? Yeah. But I'm not living with my wife. All right now, John. Who shot you? I didn't get a good look. Can you tell me what happened? My apartment. Somebody rang the bell. I opened the door and she... She started shooting. Was it a man or a woman? The light wasn't so good. Wearing slacks. Could have been a young boy. You have a girlfriend, John? All right, now, if you're getting tired, you just nod. Now, do you have a girlfriend? Was she in the apartment with you? Working. Cocktail waitress. Did she shoot you? Your wife? All my fault, anyway. Was it your wife, John? Now, did she shoot you? No pulse, no blood pressure. Did he answer on his wife? He moved his head. Was it a nod, a yes, or a no? I can't honestly say, Joe. Doc? All I can say for sure is the patient died at 11.51 p.m. Fifty-one quitting time. A.M.'s due. Sergeant? Found her down at 6 and Broadway directing traffic with these. The story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On August 23rd, a hearing was held in Department 95, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that hearing. The judge ordered the suspect to be placed under the supervision of the Department of Mental Hygiene for treatment as a mentally ill person. I didn't. My sister-in-law did. 
Woman's become a health nut. She got a hold of one of those charts to tell you how much you should weigh for how old you are and all. Turns out I'm four and a half pounds over. Maybe we can get these things open. Well, it could be worse. You wouldn't say that if you had to eat yogurt every day for a solid week. Well, the candy bar in the drawer there. Forget it. My sister-in-law is staying with us this week when her husband's back east. The minute I walk in that house tonight, I step on a scale. Well, I can't wait till three o'clock. What happens at three o'clock? I get to have an apple. Joe, Bill. Yes, sir. I want you and Bill to take a ride out to Venice. I just talked to Sergeant Porter for you, West L.A. Vice. There's a friend of his out there. Might be he's got a 653 F PC soliciting for murder. The guy's name is Steve Deal. Here's the address. He's got a record, but he's been clean four years now. Porterfield thinks he's leveling. What's that? That's my lunch, Captain. You could lose a few pounds. Yes, sir. Try an apple later if you get hungry. It'll help. possible murder solicitation. Solicitation to commit murder is a violation of section 653F of the California Penal Code. 1.32 p.m. We arrived at Stephen Deal's address. It was a cheap couple of rooms over a pottery shop. Police officers. Oh, yeah, okay. You the guy's Porterfield, sir? That's right. Friday and Gannon, homicide. Oh, come on in. This is a real wreck. I didn't expect you guys so soon. I'll just straighten it up. Don't bother. Don't bother. Just take a minute. Yeah, that's better, huh? Yeah, it's fine. Isn't that a gas? Some of Myra's work. She runs a pottery shop downstairs. That girl's a real talent. What's it supposed to be? Number 15. Huh? Myra calls it number 15. Okay. You want to tell us what this is about? Yeah, postcards right here. A thousand isn't enough. If you want to make a killing, replace the ad and give a phone number. Weird, huh? Maybe. Might not be anything. I don't know. How'd you happen to get this card, Steve? Well, I was broke, see? I mean, dirty broke. The original, plenty of nothing. Well, I uh, guess you guys know I did time. Yeah, we know. Yeah, I did a year for Grand Theft Auto. I mean, I blew one once. And, well, it happens, right? It happens. How'd you get this card? The parole thing is over now. I'm free. If I want to go, I can go anywhere. And I had a kind of an offer for a job writing some stuff. What do you write? Poems. Words for greeting cards. I studied how to do it in the joint. I got so sick of those cards people used to send me, I figured I could do better. The card? Yeah. Well, I needed bread and I needed a chunk, so I put this ad in the L.A. Happening. Just said that I was willing to do anything, repeat, anything for a thousand bucks. The L.A. Happening, what's that? One of those way out hippie newspapers, you know, comes out once a week full of weird ads and against everything. Especially cops. And this was the answer you got? Yeah, just this morning. What else did you get? Well, I got two offers of marriage. If you ever want to read some nutty letters. And a guy wanted me to take over a franchise deal on some kind of pickle thing. And another guy wanted to take moving pictures of me. Man, that letter was nothing but strange. What was it about this card that made you call Porterfield? I've been clean ever since I got out, Sergeant. I want to stay that way. I'm not about to get involved with a somebody maybe wanting to make a hit. I got to tell you, it hasn't got much to do with me being a good citizen. It's just got to do with me doing for me. I've known Milt Porterfield since school. He's always been straight with me, so I called him. What did you want the money for? About the only stuff I've sold was some Christmas material to this little company in Denver. They called me and told me if I could get set up there, I could probably sell them some more. I wanted to get there fast, and I didn't want to go poor mouth. Tell me, do you think this card could mean a hit? Who knows? I got the thing, and anyway, there was no return address on it. No nothing. Like I say, it seemed weird, and I thought I'd better let you guys worry about it. All right, we'll take this card along with us and think about it. We'll get back to you. Okay, oh, but Sergeant, uh, the thing just says if I want to make a killing, that could mean like the stock market or something. It could. Sure. But you usually say that to a man who's already got a thousand, don't you? <laughs> we returned to PAB and gave Deal's postcard to Captain Brown. It was 3.05 p.m. All right, maybe we got a 6.53 and maybe we don't. Mailed yesterday from Beverly Hills and no return. It could be anything. Yes, sir. This deal, he make any kind of walk-around money pitch for this? Never mention money. And he's broke? Yes, sir, he is. All right, call Porterfield, see what he thinks. And then let's play out the string. Have Deal place the other ad and you stand by his phone. If he's that broke, is the bill paid? Well, we'll see that it is. Do that. Joe, if we can make an arrest here, I wanted a clean one. If the guy does tumble for the second ad and calls, and we do have a solicitation to commit murder... I want you to make awful sure that you don't solicit him yourself. 
You'll just have to sell him that you're Steve Deal and make him come to you. Yes, sir, I know that. How far do you want me to go? All the way. If somebody wants somebody else knocked off, right away he doesn't worry about the rule book. And we have to. And if we spook him, there's nothing to prevent him soliciting somebody else. Yes, sir. Or maybe doing the job himself. <laughs> Tuesday, March 21st, 11.15 a.m. Deal had placed the second ad in the happening. It would run Friday morning. We had the photo lab make up a driver's license in Deal's name, only with my picture and signature. The same was done for all forms of ID that Deal would normally carry. Friday, March 24th, 9.05 a.m. The happening would be on the stands any minute. We took up a watch on Steve Deal's telephone. That's right. I placed the ad. Same as last week. Oh? Did you get a letter from a girl named Beverly? Yes, yes, I did. I got it. Well, no. No, that wouldn't work out. No, I wouldn't be interested. Yes, I am married. No, no, I wouldn't be interested, lady. Yes, ma'am. Of course, what's the matter, Joe? You're not married, and a thousand bucks is a thousand bucks. Well, you are married. Suppose somebody offered you a thousand bucks to get a divorce, would you take it? Joe, that's a terrible question to ask any married man. I guess the paper's out now. Yeah, I guess. What's going to happen when this guy calls? If I can sell him that I'm you and I need money, he'll probably arrange to meet me someplace. Uh, what if he doesn't buy it? Then we're out of luck. Somebody could get killed. Maybe. Say you do sell him your me. Then you meet him, and as soon as he asks you to kill somebody, you bust him, right? Wrong. His just asking me isn't enough. It's just his word against mine that's not admissible. He's got to give me some piece of hard evidence so I can prove that he asked me. And you got to con him into it. Can't do that either. Huh? In the law, they call that entrapment. The guy's got to solicit Joe. If Joe solicits him, his attorney will say that Joe trapped him. They'll throw it right out of court. So, you just play it by ear? Nope, with a book. Hello? Yeah? Yeah, that was me. Are you the one that sent the card? I hope you're not putting me on, mister. That extra ad cost me two bucks. Yeah, sure, I want it back. I don't have two bucks lying around all the time. But what difference does it make what I need the money for? I need it. Well, why should I tell you that? Okay, okay. My name's Steve Deal, and I write words for greeting cards. Mister, if you'd read anything I'd written, I wouldn't need the thousand bucks. Yeah, that's what I said in the ad, anything. Look, I'm not asking any questions. It doesn't matter what you want done for the money, anything. Yeah, all right, I'll meet you. I got a Ford wagon, a 60. All right, yeah, I know where that is. Okay. All right, what? No, the license number on the wagon is JUO 664. 664. All right. Nine o'clock. I'll be there. Nine o'clock tonight, exactly two and six tenths miles up Beverly Glen from sunset. I'm supposed to park the wagon there, sit in it, and wait for 20 minutes. Then I'm to drive on to Mulholland, turn left, and go seven tenths of a mile. There's a dirt shoulder there off to the right. I pull over and park. Not bad. Not bad. It means the guy can check on you and make sure nobody's following. That's smart. No, that's not smart. It's just kind of cute. How do you mean? If he was smart, he wouldn't need anybody killed in the first place. <laughs> decided that Steve Deal would visit a friend of his at Redondo Beach. He agreed to let us use his apartment until the case was concluded. 8.59 p.m. I followed the instructions and drove Deal station wagon up Beverly Glen to a point two and six tenths miles above sunset. I parked and waited. 9.20 p.m. I started the wagon and moved out for the spot off Mulholland. Two undercover police cars were on a rolling stakeout in the area, and Bill had the meeting place under surveillance. 9.37 p.m. I'd been waiting over 12 minutes. 
Why do you need the money? My definition of anything is just what the word says, anything. Why I need the money is my business. I'm not asking you any questions. You got some identification? Yeah. Here. Maybe we can talk some business. Then let's talk it. Now, you said there was more than a thousand in it. If I decide you're the man for the job, there is. I'd want you to steal something for me. Well, I didn't figure it was going to be legal. Something that belongs to my wife. A locket. A locket? What's it worth? About 200. Grand? Dollars. You're going to pay me a thousand bucks or more just to steal a locket worth 200? That's right. Except I wouldn't want any witnesses. You wouldn't? No. If there were any witnesses, we couldn't do any business. You always talk in circles, fella. Why don't you tell me what you really want? I told you. I want a locket taken. Yeah. But since I wouldn't want any witnesses, and since she wears it constantly, she'd have to be killed. Well, you finally said the words, didn't you? Now what happens? Now we got something to talk about. You want somebody killed, it'll cost you five. Two. Four. Three. Three. My wife is an unusual one. She's a predictable alcoholic. She was brought up to believe that no decent person drinks before five in the afternoon. She doesn't, but by six she's loaded every night of her life. I don't want her dead so much for the fact that she's drunk after five as I do that she's sober before it. That's my problem. When you hit her, I'd like it to hurt. But there's no sense taking that chance. All right, how are you going to work it? I want you to walk into the house and hit my wife over the head with a length of galvanized iron pipe. Hit her as many times as you like. Just make sure you hit her hard and that the job is done. She'll be passed out on the couch in the study. She always is. She won't hear you come in. I can make sure of that with a little pure alcohol in her scotch. You're going to give me a key to the place? You won't need a key. I'll leave the front door open for you. You walk in, get it done, then go to the desk in the study. There'll be a thousand in cash taped under the middle drawer. You take that and the locket from my wife's neck, and you meet me back up here at a time I'll give you later, and you get your other two thousand. Look, I got a case to the place. At least give me the address. It's going to take me until Sunday to set my alibi. If I decide to use you, I'll give you the address then. All right. If you decide... We got a contract. No. We've got an understanding. Yeah. I'll let you know on Sunday if we've got a contract. Ten thirteen PM, the suspect got into his car and drove off. He had given me nothing to build a case with. This number into DMV. There's no one on it. Nothing back from records yet. I'll give you odds it's not his car. No bet. You think he's leveling? He wants his wife dead, Bill. Now he's either going to have me do it or he's going to get somebody else to do it. Yeah. Or he might even do it himself. Saturday, March 25th, 8.07 a.m. The undercover police cars on Rolling Stakeout had tailed the suspect down to Sunset, but they had lost him when he had abandoned the car in Hollywood. Riley Maxwell of Leighton Prince had gone over the car. It was clean. DMV records in Sacramento had run it down as belonging to a Mrs. Dorothy Cayley at an address on Tula Rosa. Yes, ma'am. Well, thank you. Now, you be sure and lock your car after this, will you? Thanks again. Mrs. Cayley had her bridge club in last night. She didn't even know the thing had been stolen. Didn't lock it when she parked it last night, huh? No, she didn't. Keys on the sun visor. Glove compartment. Why didn't she put a sign on it? I want some coffee, Joe. I'll be glad to run up and get you a cup. No, thanks. Relax. Don't let it get to you. Someplace out in this city, there's a man making up his mind whether or not to use me to murder his wife, and I don't like it. Joe, there's nothing we can do about it till he calls again. I don't know. Maybe I just should have pulled him in last night. You'd have blown the case. Yeah, but maybe it might have scared him off. Sunday, March 26th, 8 a.m. Bill and I took up a telephone watch in Steve Deal's apartment. There had been no way to get a make on the suspect. The only thing we could do now was wait for him to call. 10.27 p.m. 14 hours went by. The telephone had not rung. One thing I gotta do. Yeah, what's that? If that's called number 15, sometime I gotta go and find out what number 16 looks like. Yeah. You know, if this character does call, he's gonna try and have some cute setup where we can't follow him. 
The only chance we got to nail them is for you to go all the way with them. That could add up to anything. Well, we don't have much choice, do we? No, we don't. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I still want that 3,000. But when? Where? Yeah, anything you say. Said I should go out and just start driving. Where to? Said I'd find out. Think we ought to try a loose tail on you? He might be trying that himself. 10.48 p.m. Deal station wagon was parked in front of the apartment. I didn't know where or how the suspect would try and make contact. Page 281 of the Western Directory phone book had been torn out and left on the front seat of the car. The address of Jason Lum, 10788 Bellagio Road, Bel Air, had been circled. 11.17 p.m. I arrived at 10788 Bellagio. Again, you follow instructions very well. I still need the dough. Is this it? No, this was just a checkout. Go back to your place and wait. I'll call you. You'll call me when? You know, the minute the phone rings. Eleven twenty-five p.m. I return to Deal's apartment. Another false alarm? Yeah. Well, we got two undercover units in the area now. They got your wagon staked out. Anybody goes near it, they'll tell them. Okay. You think he'll try the same thing again? It's a big phone book. One twenty-two a.m. Monday, March twenty-seven. The suspect had called again. Another page of the phone book had been dropped in the station wagon. This time, the address was in West Los Angeles. It was another false alarm. 2.15 a.m., I returned to Deal's apartment for the second time. Right, thanks. We got him, Joe. The tail made him this time. Name's Forrester, Harvey L., 10671 Shalon Road, Bel Air. Anything on him? No, he's clean. Well, what do we got then? A name and an address. Yeah. All we need now is a case to go with it. 3.10 a.m. The suspect, whom we now knew to be Harvey Forrester, called again, and I was given an address in Inglewood. This time I knew it was the wrong address. Monday, March 27th. There was no word at all from Forrester during the daylight hours. 10.12 p.m. Forrester called. This time I was given instructions. I was told to go to the address I'd find in the station wagon and wait for 15 minutes. If I didn't hear from him... I was to enter the house and get the job done. Then I was to meet him at the place off Mulholland and receive the rest of the money. The address he circled was his own. Harvey Forrester, 10671 Shallon Road, Bel Air. I called Bill on the walkie-talkie and filled him in. I drove out to Bel Air. I was two blocks from Forrester's address on Shallon Road. It was 10.32 p.m. Joe, you better hold it up. What's going on? Forrester is now trying to establish an alibi. He's inside that house right now. You can figure the rest. I kill the wife, he kills me. Looks that way, doesn't it? Yeah, the only trouble is it doesn't change anything. We still don't have anything admissible against him. Well, Joe, maybe the woman's already dead. What's to stop him from trying to kill you the minute you open the door? He's afraid to kill his wife. If he wasn't, she'd have been dead before this. Now, I think he has to have somebody else do the job for him. Who are you trying to convince, me or you? p.m. I drove the remaining two blocks to the Forrester house, parked and waited for 15 minutes. There was no sign of the suspect. 10.52 p.m. I left the wagon and started for the house. By now, Bill and the other three officers working the stakeout would have had enough time to get into position. Bill and I had agreed that they would give me three minutes inside to smoke Forrester out before moving in to back me up. Forrester had to be somewhere close. I couldn't see him.
getting yourself an alibi. True. But instead, I'm about to shoot a burglar with a thousand dollars of my money in his pocket. I don't need an alibi. Sorry, Deal. Your mistake. No, Forrester, you made the mistake. I'm a police officer, and there are four more right outside. Now, you be a good boy, and you walk over there and put that gun on that desk. You've got nothing on me? Nothing at all. Don't we? Here's the thousand, under the drawer, like he said. I'll get a photog out here, Joe. Drunk? Yeah. I'll call an ambulance. Right. How'd you find me, anyway? How did you know who I was? You fell in love with the phone book. The second time you tried that page bit, you were followed. <sighs> Lousy, sloppy drunk. Don't knock her, Forrester. She had a good reason to drink. And what's that? Being married to you. The story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On May 29th, trial was held in Department 186, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was found guilty of soliciting the commission of a murder, an offense which is punishable by imprisonment in the county jail not longer than one year, or in the state prison not longer than... Monday, May 4th. We were working the day watch out of Juvenile Division. The boss is Captain Morris. My partner's Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. We checked in for work at 8 a.m. By 8.05, Bill looked ready to check out. Hard night? No easy night. It's gonna be a hard day, though. I didn't know you drank. Well, I'm not an alcoholic, Joe. I had two martinis before dinner, that's all. I guess I'm not as young as I used to be. You and Eileen go out last night, did you? Over to her sister's. Charlie, my brother-in-law, added a den to his house, so, of course, we had to go over and look at it. Nice den? You've seen one, you've seen them all. Sure wasn't worth the price. Cost him a lot to build, huh? I'm not talking about what it cost him. I'm talking about what it cost me. Juvenile Friday. Where? What's that address on Cooley? Yes, ma'am, that's right. No, don't touch a thing. Yes, ma'am. We'll be right out. Over on East Cooley in a trash can. Yeah? A four-day-old baby girl. Uh... 9.40 a.m., we arrived at the alley behind 3360 East Cooley. You the police? Yes, ma'am. There's the baby, right there. Rudy here found it. I called you right away. Isn't this just dreadful? Yes, ma'am. We knew we shouldn't move it until you arrived. Imagine that. It's a little girl. Can't be over four or five days old. Better get an ambulance out here and fast. Who in the world would do such a dreadful thing? It's absolutely inhuman. You found the baby, did you? Yes, sir. I was cleaning up the backyard here, and I heard the crying. I thought at first it was a cat. You know, I don't believe what I see. No baby belongs in a barrel with trash. It's a sin against yours to throw a baby away like old leaves. What kind of mother could do this terrible thing? Ambulance is on the way. Do you have any idea who left the baby here? I do not. This is a high-grade neighborhood. Yes, ma'am, I understand that. But did you see anybody in the area, any strangers? No. Someone must have driven through our alley and put her in that trash can. What kind of a monster would do such a dreadful thing? Will you be able to find them, whoever did this? We're going to try. I hope the scum are made to suffer for this. They must be suffering much already to do such a thing. Ten fifteen a.m. We followed the ambulance to the Los Angeles County Hospital. All 
the time I've been on the job, I thought I'd seen it all. A baby in a trash can. Doctor, what's the condition of the child? It looks bad, Joe, real bad. The infant's no more than three or four days old. Now, fortunately, last night was relatively warm. A little four-day-old girl just isn't built to spend all night in a garbage can. Is she gonna live? I'd say maybe, Bill, but that'd be too encouraging. I better get back to him. We'd like that blanket, Doc. Send it right out, you. Thank you. We can drop the blanket off at SID on our way back to that apartment house. You know, when you think of all the people who'd give everything they've got to have a baby like that, and some poor excuse for a human being throws it away in a trash can. Thank you very much. Gray. Whoever heard of a gray baby blanket? Supposed to be pink for a little girl. Whoever heard of a pink shroud? After emergency treatment, the child would be placed in the intensive care section of the hospital. 10.45 a.m., we dropped the baby's blanket off at Scientific Investigation Division. Then we drove back to 3360 East Cooley to talk with the manager, Sylvia Crystal. How's that baby? We won't know for a while, Mrs. Crystal. We'd like to ask you a few questions. Oh, certainly. Have you any idea at all who might have abandoned that baby? Oh, like I told you before, no idea in the world. I just can't imagine anyone doing such a thing. How about one of your tenants? Could any oh, of them... Oh, no, no, officer, not my tenants. I'll bet anything it happened the way I told you before. Somebody driving through that alley. That's a possibility, Mrs. Crystal, but as a rule, people don't go too far from home when they abandon a child. You mean things like this happen frequently? Yes, ma'am, more frequently than we'd like. When they make up their minds to do a thing like this, they generally pick the closest and nearest place. Now, since the baby was left in your service area, your apartment house is the natural place to begin, isn't it? I see your point. Well, of course, you're welcome to speak to all my tenants, but most of them are at work now. And frankly, Sergeant Friday, most of them are a little too old to be new parents. How about your younger tenants? Mm, the only younger people we have in the building are the Conways and 2C. They have a child. And then we have a couple of girls sharing 2A, Patty Lazar and Christine White. Now, Patty's a secretary and Christine's a nurse. They only moved in last month. Both are nice, quiet girls. And then there's Donna Halpern in 1E. She moved in last week. I believe she's a librarian. Her fiancé is in Vietnam. She showed me his picture. All right. Thank you very much, Miss Crystal. Tell me, do you always manage to find the parents in these cases? Usually. And when you do, are they sorry for what they've done? Sometimes. Sometimes they're only sorry that we found them. To see the Conways. Yes. We're police officers. We'd like to ask you a few questions. What's wrong? A baby was found abandoned in the alley down back. We were just checking to see if you have any idea who might have left it. How old was it? Three, four days. Gee, that's awful. Do you know any young women in the neighborhood who were expecting? Gee, no. Is the baby dead? Not quite. It's terrible. I know some of the young mothers in the neighborhood. I see them in the park, you know, when I take Howard, my six-year-old, out for a stroll. But I can't help you. Molly Blaine's pregnant, but she only found out last week. It'll be her fourth. I see. Who are you guys? They're policemen, Howard. No, they ain't. Aren't? Yes, they are. And if you don't behave, they'll arrest you and put you in jail. Oh, no, they won't. They ain't policemen, neither. Well, thank you very much, Miss Conway. Uh, sorry I couldn't help. I'm the policeman around here, and if they don't behave themselves, I'm going to stick them in the slammer and turn the key. Well, sorry to trouble you, Mrs. Conway. <sighs> Not at all. Bye, Howard. Go melt, Shorty. Shorty, I meant to shorty him where he sits down. Two A, Patty Lazar and Christine White. Now there's nobody home. Well, the next one's downstairs. Boy, that Howard's really something, isn't he? Oh, forget it. It was only water. With a kid like that, how can you be sure? Don't help him, Mike. Donna Halpern? Yes, I am. We're police officers. We'd like to ask you a few questions. Excuse me, I'm just getting over a cold. About what? An abandoned baby. It was found in the alley behind your building this morning. We were wondering if you might have some idea who the parents are. No, I haven't any idea. We understand you only moved in last week. Are you from the area? Yes, I was living with my parents. They live over on Evanview, just a few blocks away. But now that I'm working, I decide to get a place of my own. This is just temporary. My fiancé, Tony, is in Vietnam. When he gets back, we'll be getting married and buying a home. Then you don't have any idea who that baby belongs to? No, I don't. Sorry. Well, thank you very much, Miss Halpern. The baby. Was it a boy or girl? It was a little girl. How old would you say it was? Three, four days. 
That's a shame. Is it all right? Well, she was still alive an hour and a half ago. Well, I sure hope you find who you're looking for. We will. What will happen to the child? I mean, if she lives. She'll be made a ward of the court and placed in a foster home with parents who will let her sleep in a crib, not a trash can. Well, that's the important thing, isn't it? Ma'am. That things turn out well for the baby. I mean, even if, God forbid, the baby dies, it's better this way, isn't it? This way? In a hospital, I mean. It would be terrible to die in a trash can. I can think of something worse. Yes? Being four days old and only having those two alternatives. <laughs> One thirty-five p.m., we canvassed the neighborhood for any information on the abandoned baby. No one seemed to have any idea who the parents of the child might be. One of the residents suggested we might try the Colonial Soda Shop. It was a gathering place for the young people who lived in the neighborhood, including students from the local high school. 3.15 p.m., we drove over to the Colonial Soda Shop. We asked several of the young people, but they could tell us nothing about the abandoned baby. Well, what do you think? I don't know. Maybe that crystal woman was right. Maybe someone did drive through the alley and drop the baby. Sir? Yes, miss? I didn't want to say anything in front of the kids. We understand. It seems so catty. You'll think I'm terrible. Maybe I shouldn't say anything. What's your name? Lisa Bogart. If you have any information at all on that abandoned baby, we want you to tell us. You won't tell her now, will you? What's her name? Sissy Tucker. I'm probably wrong, but Sissy's been out of school for over a week. Sissy Tucker. Well, she's... Well, she dates a lot, goes out with a lot of the guys. Some of the fellas say things about her. You know what I mean. You think I'm terrible, don't you? I mean, to be informing on her. No, miss, you did the right thing. Now, do you know where this Tucker girl lives? Come on, now. You've told us this much. Tell us where she lives. I feel like a rat. You won't if we find the mother of that abandoned baby, now, will you? No, I guess not. She lives at 2714 Leitner Avenue. All right, thank you very much, Miss Bogart. One more thing. Maybe you can understand why I feel so bad about this. What's that? She's my best friend. p.m. Bill and I drove over to 2714 Leitner Avenue to talk to the girl by the name of Sissy Tucker. Yes? We're police officers. We'd like to ask you a few questions. Oh, is it about that ticket I got last week? No, ma'am. Does a girl by the name of Sissy Tucker live here? Yes, I'm her mother. We understand she's been absent from school recently. Is that a crime? No, ma'am. We were just wondering why. What do you mean you were just wondering why? child misses a week of school and they send the police out to check on her? Is that really all you have to do with your time? But you go out and catch criminals. Sissy is no criminal. We're not truant officers, Mrs. Tucker. A young baby was abandoned in this neighborhood last night, and we thought maybe your daughter might help us locate who the child belongs to. You decided my Sissy is an unwed mother. I have a good mind to sue you. Now, we didn't say that, Mrs. Tucker. Well, you heard what I said. What right have you got to come around here and cast aspersions on my daughter? We're not casting any aspersions. We'd like to locate the parents of that baby. You find some little brat and right off you decide my sissy's its mother. If that's not casting aspersions, I'd like to know what it is. We understand your daughter has been absent from school for over a week. We have a four-day-old infant on our hands who might be dead by now. We want to know who, we want to know why. If your feelings have been hurt, we're sorry. If your daughter's reputation has been stained, we apologize. But that doesn't change the fact that we have to check it out. Now, if somebody tells us your daughter might know something that would be helpful to us, we have to run it down. That's why we're here, Mrs. Tucker. Well, she's been in bed with the Hong Kong flu. She's at the Good Mercy Hospital. You can call over there and you can check on that, and that's the truth. What else do they say about Sissy? We understand she sees quite a few boys. That's true. She likes the boys, and the boys like her. She's a little wild, but she's not a bad girl. Her father and I are divorced, and that hasn't been easy for her. She's not a bad girl, though. And one other thing. What's that, Miss Tucker? Sissy would never get pregnant. You're sure of that, are you? I ought to know she's been on the pill for two years. Four fifteen PM. We drove back to the PAB and went upstairs to the crime lab to check with Don Hale on the blanket the abandoned baby was wrapped in. Don, did you turn anything on that blanket? No, not a whole lot. Nothing unusual about it, just a common gray blanket. You can buy them almost anywhere. It's old and it's worn. And that's it, huh? Mm, no, not quite. 
Metal tag here. No number on it. The face is worn off, as you can see. The blanket's been dry cleaned or it's been laundered? I wish I could tell you which or where. <laughs> No, it wasn't much, but it was worth a try. We checked all the laundries and cleaning establishments in the immediate area where the baby had been abandoned. We struck out. The last place on the list was Patterson's Dry Cleaning Emporium, 3754 Vanessa Lane, three blocks from where the abandoned baby had been found. 4.40 p.m. It was a long shot at best. Mr. Patterson? Yes, sir. Police officers. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? You use this kind of metal tag? Yes, we do. What's the trouble? Oh, I can see the trouble. There's no face on it. There's no number on it either, is there? No, sir. Do you recognize the blanket? It's gray, and it could use a good cleaning. Have you ever seen it before? No way I could tell you that. Some things a fellow remembers who belongs to what. Like certain kind of drapes with flowers on them. Like a special kind of afghan, maybe. Like a college blanket with a name on it. Like a mini skirt. Those things a man might remember, but this blanket, I don't remember it. I see. Is it important? That's a dumb question. If it weren't important, you wouldn't be here. That's right, sir. It looks just like a hundred other blankets that come through here every week. What's it all about? Can you tell me? A <laughs> dumb question. Of course you can't tell me. It's a police matter, right? Yes, sir. Well, I tell you how I feel about you policemen. You're a hard-working bunch, day and night, night and day. And whatever it is you're looking for with this blanket, I wish you all the luck to find it. Well, thank you very much, sir. For what? For nothing. You got a tough case on your hands? A <laughs> dumb question. Of course you got a tough case, right? Right. Four forty five PM. We'd reached a dead end. The one lead we had faded when the cleaner couldn't come up with an identification on the blanket. We figured the only thing left to do was to double back over the course. We drove over to the colonial soda shop to give it another try. Police officers, we'd like to ask you a few questions. Sure. We're looking for a girl who had a baby in the last few days. Now do you know such a girl and where we might locate her? What do you want her for? Routine investigation. Did she do something wrong? We'd like to talk to her. Do you know a girl like that? Yeah, I might. You might or you do? I don't know exactly. What does that mean? It means what it says. I don't know exactly. Some place where we could talk privately. Room in the back. Let's use it. What's your name? Paul Sutherland. How old are you? 18. All right, now, Paul, you were doing a lot of talking out there, but you weren't saying anything. Well, what do you think the rest of that bunch out there is going to think of me now? You bringing me back in here and all. They're not going to think anything if this is as far as we take you now, are they? Well, you got a point there. Now, you make a couple with us, son. If you know anything about the girl that we're asking about, suppose you tell us. It's important. Well, I don't want to get anybody into trouble. Look, Paul, we got a little four-day-old baby who was abandoned. We want to find out who she belongs to, and if you can help us, we'd appreciate it. Now, do you know a girl who had a baby recently? Well, say I do. What then? You give us her name or address, then you go back and finish your ice cream. Well, you know what you're doing? You're making me think. You haven't got the right to do that. It's not right what you're trying to make me do here. You go indie and wrestle your conscience on your own time, Paul. Right now, we need a name, and we need it quick. You know it. Now you spell it for us. All right, son, you write your own ticket. We can talk here or down at Juvenile. OK. Well, I can't tell you much, just what I know. I had a buddy. He's in the Army now. Before he shipped off, he told me he had made this girl pregnant. He told me he was glad he was going over to Vietnam because he didn't want to be around when the baby came. And that was six, seven months ago he went over. You know the girl's name? I never met her. Tony was a year ahead of me in high school. She was in his class. All he ever called her was Fat Donna. Thanks, Paul. You've given us a lot of help. That may be, but I want to tell you this. What's that? I'll never forgive you for making me think on a friend. Now, what do you think of that? Oh, we'll survive. 5.35 p.m. We return to Donna Halpern's apartment. Oh, hello. May we come in? Certainly. Sit down if you like. I don't know why you came back. I told you everything I knew before. Are you sure about that, Miss Halpern? I am. We're going to advise you of your constitutional rights. You have the right to remain silent. If you give up the right to remain silent, anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to speak with an attorney and to have the attorney present during questioning. If you so desire and cannot afford one, an attorney will be appointed for you without charge before questioning. Do you understand that? Yes, but I don't understand why you read all that stuff to me. Did you give birth to a baby girl four days ago? What? 
Did you deposit that little girl in a trash can last night? What are you saying? I'm saying that a kid named Tony had bragged a friend several months ago that he'd gotten a girl named Donna pregnant. He went to Vietnam. She had his baby. She doesn't have it anymore. Now, how would you add that up? He told me that he wanted to marry me. That's what he said. We were engaged. He said he liked me. Even when I got pregnant, Tony said he was happy about it. He said we get married as soon as he got back. He even wrote me letters from Vietnam saying how much he loved me and missed me. I was happy having his baby. That way he'd have a family waiting for him when he got home. Then last week, I got a letter from him. It's all over, he said. He was getting married to an Oriental girl. Getting married to somebody else. Two days after his letter arrived, I had his child in the bathroom. I delivered it myself. I kept it there for three days. I thought I learned to love it. But every time I looked at it, it reminded me of Tony, that he was married to somebody else. The baby looked exactly like him. I couldn't stand it. She had his eyes, his nose. Nobody knew I was pregnant. I'm so heavy that it didn't show. And the baby was so quiet. It never cried. Even the neighbors next door didn't know about her. Last night, I, I took her out and put her in the trash can. You wanted to kill her? No. I just didn't care. I just couldn't stand to look at her anymore, that's all. I just couldn't help hating her. I burned all of Tony's letters and I threw his baby in the trash. That way I was free of him. As far as I was concerned, there was nothing else I could do. You can see that, can't you? No, lady, we can't see it. You're under arrest. What'll happen to me? Well, that's up to the court. You don't think very much of me, do you? Let me put it this way. You'll never make mother of the year, lady. At 48 p.m., on our way downtown to book the suspect, Donna Halpern, we stopped off at the county hospital to check on her baby's condition. Joe. Bill? How's the baby? Well, either I'm a great doctor, which I'm not, or there's a God. Child's gonna live. You're right twice, Doc. She's weak, but she'll make it. You're the mother, are you? Like to see your baby? I already did once. Does she have a name? Call her whatever you like. She's all yours. You really have a low opinion of me, don't you? Does it matter? You don't think I'm worth much, do you? Isn't that your opinion? My opinion and 12 cents will buy you a cup of coffee. Tell me what you think. I don't think, lady. No, I want to know. What's your opinion? You probably think I should go to the gas chamber, don't you? The little brat is still alive and kicking. So what's the big crime? Come on, you're a big, strong policeman. You tell me, what's the crime? Let's you and me level with each other, lady. You want a soft answer to a hard question. Now, you fight that up with yourself, but I'll give you this much. You got yourself pregnant, strung along by the guy, and then he dropped you. Now, maybe you should have known better, but a lot of women older than you have wound up in the same bind. That's exactly right. It was all Tony's fault. Maybe, until four days ago. Then you became responsible for a human life, but you had a choice. That's more than your baby had. Nobody asked her who she wanted for parents. Now, maybe that boyfriend of yours is a two-timing punk, but that baby needed you far more than you needed him. And how did you answer her need? You used your choice. You took a human being, your own little girl, and you threw her out like a bag of garbage. What's going to happen to me? That's up to the court and your conscience. Or did you throw that away, too, while you were at it? The story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On July 6th, trial was held in Department 183, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was found guilty of violating Section 273... 
increasing number of crimes having a significant M.O. and the fact that we had no leads or suspects, our first job was to try and prevent additional crimes. Sergeant Dan Cook of Public Affairs Division arranged one means for warning potential victims. He called a news conference with representatives from every branch of the news media. 10.30 a.m., we completed the briefing and all those present agreed to cooperate. One representative was a good friend of Bill's and mine and the department's. He was 15 minutes late. Never fear, Woody Hill's here. Looks like I'm a touch late, that's the... No problem, Dick. How are you? Fine, couldn't be better. What do you two guys got on your devious minds? Dan Cook said something about a news conference. Now, it's a little more than just a news conference, Dick. We need your help. Name it. We've asked the newspapers, radio, and TV people to engage in a little crime prevention for us. Well, you mean the lock your car or never give a burglar an even break campaign? No, not this time. There's a new M.O. that's popped up during the last few weeks, Dick. We're having a hard time finding a suspect, and we'd like to prevent as many scores as we can before she's apprehended. She? Right, one woman, between 30 and 35, uses the names Davis or Marshall. Picks elderly people as their victims and steals them blind. Sounds like a real nice lady. That's exactly the problem we're dealing with. Her M.O. is she's extremely nice and helpful. We've had 16 reports during the past two weeks. Same thing every time. Suspect picks out a house usually occupied by elderly pensioners, knocks on the door and goes into her act. Which is? Well, first, she tells her victims that she was set out by an employment agency for a domestic job. When the victims say they don't know anything about it, she goes into an act of being surprised and disappointed. After a little more conversation, she cons her way to get inside the house. How does she manage that? Usually she wants to use the telephone to check back with the employment agency. Does she make a call? We don't know, but she goes through the motions of making one. When she hangs up, she tells them a mistake had been made, and she thanks the people for their kindness. And that's it? Oh, no. That's where the performance really starts. She always wants to repay them for being so kind, and the victims go for it. Repay them? How's that? Usually anything she can do to be helpful, you know, straighten a pillow, read them a story, turn the radio on, put something away that's too heavy for the old people to lift. She gives them a real strong Good Samaritan routine. Well, how's she take them? What's the con? No con to it. She tries to find a way to get into another room where valuables are kept. Then she takes what she can, usually money or jewelry, makes a smooth exit before the victim knows what happened. She's a regular Florence Nightingale. That's about it. Easy targets and poor witnesses. What better victims can a hoodlum find? Do you have any leads on who she is? No, not so far. It's at a point now that we've asked all patrol divisions to call us direct for the preliminary investigation. When the pattern started building, we requested CII up in Sacramento to make an M.O. check. That should be back any day now. But they might not turn up anything. That's why we need your help, Dick. It's becoming an epidemic. And you're asking for me to tell a story about this nice lady on my radio program. That's it. As many times a day as you can work it in. Well, I'm glad to help, Joe, but don't you think a lot of publicity will scare the suspect off? We're willing to take that chance, Dick. I'd rather try to prevent new jobs than wind up catching her after she's fleeced a dozen or more old people. Okay, makes sense. I'll give it everything I can. We appreciate it, Dick. One more thing. What's that? When you put out the story, encourage your listeners to call us if they're approached by anyone that might fit our suspect, will you? Will do. What's your number down here? Madison 45211. Got it. Hope I can do some good. So do we. Burglary Auto Friday. Yes, sir. What's that address? Yes, sir. We'll go right out. Wilshire Division Watch Commander. Looks like our helpful woman hit again. A couple in their 70s. She really must have sent her conscience out to lunch. Most thieves do. a.m. We drove to the latest victim's home at 1620 Kilmore Street. We identified ourselves to Martha Anderson, the wife of 77-year-old Chester Anderson. Mrs. Anderson was 72. And what are you boys going to do about it? Are you going to nab her? Yes, sir, we're going to try if you'll tell us what happened here. I'll tell you what happened. That young lady thief took all our money. That's what happened. I still can't believe it, Sergeant. She was such a nice young woman. Did she tell you her name? Yes, she introduced herself as Miss Davis. She was a pony. All that sweet talk and making over everything. All right, sir. Now, why don't we go back to the beginning and you can tell us how it all started. It was yesterday afternoon, Sergeant. I'll tell it, Martha. You fix these boys and me a little nip. Thanks just the same, Mr. Anderson. Well, you don't know what you're missing, son. It's the best sour mash there is. I'm sure it is, Mr. Anderson. It's just a little early yet. Oh, uh, you younger generation just don't know how to live. That's why we got a dip. You're not having any either, Chester. You know what the doctor said. No, that soft-headed know-it-all. I say, if you can't enjoy life, then you might just as well buy a plot and climb into it. You know what I mean, Sergeant? Yes, sir, I think so. Now about this lady. She ain't no lady. She's a two-bit thief. 
Jester. He insists she took the money, Sergeant. I finally agreed to call, but I'm not convinced that she did take it. She took it all right. There's nobody else could have. Oh, she was a sweet, kind woman looking for work. They sent her to the wrong address is all. Did she tell you that, ma'am? That Jezebel told her all kinds of things. I saw through her right off. It was about five o'clock yesterday evening. I answered the door, and there she was. Said she was sent out by the employment agency. Did she mention which one, ma'am? Yes, sir. As I recall, it was Apex. Yes, the Apex Employment Agency. That's a phony if I ever heard one. Yes, sir. Would you go ahead, please, ma'am? Well, she told me they'd sent her out to be interviewed for a job as a maid and practical nurse. When I told her we didn't know anything about it, the poor thing got real worried and upset, you know? Yes, ma'am. Now, where did this conversation take place? It was all on the front porch out there. She asked to use the telephone, you know, to find out if there was a mistake. Yeah, that's how she finagled her way in the house, asking to use the telephone. <laughs> That's some dodge, ain't it? Did she make a call? Yes, I showed her to the phone and she called the employment agency. The conversation was quite long. About 25 units worth. Yes, sir. Did she say anything after she hung up? The employment agency had made a mistake. She was terribly upset. Upset, hogwash. It was all put on. Well, maybe. But she was so sincere. She apologized for inconveniencing us and asked if she could help with anything. No charge, of course. Yeah, no charge. Sure cost us enough in the long run, though. What happened then? Oh, we started talking about this and that. You know, she asked how long we'd been married and how many children we had. That's what you policemen call getting a person's confidence into, Sergeant. Wasn't any of her business at all. Yes, sir. Now, where was the money that's missing? In my purse in the kitchen. Three hundred dollars. Did the woman ever go into the kitchen by herself? She sure did. That's why I keep saying she took it. Nobody else could have. Well, now, what were the circumstances that got her into the kitchen by herself? My stomach pills. It was time for Chester to take his digestion pills. I was about to get a glass of water, and she offered, told me to just sit still. She was so nice about it. That's when she stole our money. We didn't find out about it till this morning. I went to pay the milkman, and it was gone. All of it. Well, now, is there any possibility someone else could have taken it? No, sir, Sergeant. Nobody else had been here, and Martha locks up tight at night. It's just so hard to believe that dear woman could do such a thing. Oh, Chester's right. No one else could have taken it, and I know I had the money just before she arrived. Well, how do you know that for sure, ma'am? Did you check it? Yes, sir. It was the money from our Social Security checks. My neighbor, Mrs. Parker, cashed them for us at the market. When she brought the money back, I counted it and put it right in my purse. It wasn't ten minutes later that lady came. She read out loud to us. I beg your pardon, sir. You tell her, Martha. That's why my wife just can't believe that woman took our money. After she came from the kitchen, she read aloud to us the 23rd Psalm from the Bible. <laughs> Twelve ten p.m. After completing a crime report and arranging with Leighton Prince to dust Mrs. Anderson's purse, we returned to the office. The M.O. request we had made to C.I.I. arrived from Sacramento. They turn anything? Yeah, there's something more than a no-hit letter in here. Looks like that C.I.I. computer's put in a good day's work. Yeah, three possibles on our M.O. description. Wilma Tam, female Caucasian, 35, arrested six times in the past four years. Burglary and petty theft, all arrests up in Oakland. Thelma Musset, female Caucasian, 40, 14 arrests, three for burglary. The cover letter here says she's doing one to five. That lets her out. Number three, Evelyn Gentry, female Caucasian, 32, one arrest for burglary, Pasadena, California, three years ago. What was the dispo? Released insufficient evidence. Not much to go on. Three possibles in the entire state, and one of them's in jail. That leaves us two to work on. Yeah, no telling where either one of them is. Where to now? I'd say we start with our neighbor to the north. The home of the Rose Bowl. <laughs> telephone call to the Pasadena Police Department located the investigator that had handled the Evelyn Gentry case three years prior. After a short conversation, we knew he had information which would make a trip to Pasadena worthwhile. Sergeant Bert Crow of the Pasadena Police Department Detective Bureau was well prepared and happy to see us. How many hits have you had over there in L.A.? We had number 17 yesterday. Yeah, she's doing okay. How long has it been going on? Well, the first report came in about two weeks ago. No telling how many have gone unreported. I know what you mean. We haven't had one similar occurrence since I picked up this Jeffrey woman three years ago. I'd like to look over my case package. All the reports are there. Thanks, Wade. How many hits have you had? Before we got her? That's right. Five. All old people. The youngest victim I had was 80. The oldest, 94. 
She operated about a month before we nailed her. Have you come across this Evelyn Gentry since you picked her up three years ago? No, I'm delighted to say. In fact, I was kind of surprised when you called. Well, how's that, Bert? Well, as you probably know, we lost the case. But picking her up had a residual effect. As soon as the judge kicked her loose, she left town. Went back east somewhere. I watched her board the train. Maybe she came back, Bert, according to your reports. Employment agency scam, nice, pleasant, helpful personality, elderly victims, the whole bit. Yeah, but it still doesn't make us a case, does it? Be an easy M.O. to copy. That's evidence by the fact that C.I.I. had two others. Have you shown her mugshot around yet? No, we haven't. We just got the C.I.I. info this morning. Thought we'd check your end out first. I'm glad you did. Take my advice before you go back to all your victims with pictures. Get them blown up to at least 8 by 10. Poor eyesight, huh? You better believe it. Among other reasons, that contributed to our losing the case. When you count on eyewitness testimony and the witness doesn't see too well, stand by to lose your case. How'd you find her three years ago? Lucky break. I had a concerned citizen. One of my victim's neighbors noticed a strange car in the neighborhood and wrote down the license number. Later that day, she saw a policeman taking a report and gave it to him. It paid off. We checked with DMV, and based on the description given by the victim, we picked up Evelyn Gentry at her home. Was the victim a good witness? The best I had out of five. 87 years old. Is that right? He died of a coronary before we got to trial. The other four either had bad eyesight or were just too old to give understandable testimony. Rough way to lose a case. Yeah, and Evelyn Gentry was enjoying herself all the way. No cop out, huh? Not on your life. I gave her the Miranda. She stood on the whole enchilada, not a peep. Hmm. Okay. Thanks a lot, Bert. You guys do me a favor if you find her. Well, yeah, sure. Don't scare her back into Pasadena. <laughs> October 10th, 8.35 a.m. Acting on the advice of Sergeant Bert Crow, we obtained 8 by 10 inch blow-up photos of Evelyn Gentry, Wilma Tam, Thelma Musset, and two police women for examination by the victims. Do you have any other evidence going for you beside this photo show? Us? We ought to know any time now, Captain. Leighton Prince lifted one partial off the Anderson woman's purse yesterday. Now we've got fingerprint cards from CII on two of our potential suspects, Wilma Tam and Evelyn Gentry. Print man's on his way up now. And if this doesn't pan out, what do you have in mind? A lot of footwork with these mug shots. Morning, gentlemen. Morning, Carl. Thanks for coming up. Did you do any good? Right here. DR number 69532960, right? You have the cards? Okay. does it? There's your suspect. Evelyn Gentry. Is it solid? Oh, it's hers, all right, but not good enough for court. How many points did you make? Seven. Three short. Yep, three more and you would have had her flat out. But it's her, all right. I just can't say so in court where it counts. Well, it's a start. Thanks, Carl. Anytime. We couldn't have used it by itself anyway. Why not? Not conclusive she went in that purse. No, the print was lifted from the outside just below the snap. Reasonable doubt, huh? That's it, Skipper. Well, you two know what's next. Yeah, legwork, lots of it. Gregory Auto Friday. Yes, ma'am, this is the police department. What's that address? No, ma'am, you wait right there. We'll be out in 20 minutes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Maybe we got a break. What's that? A lady out on Redwood Street heard about the M.O. on the radio. She listens to Whitting Hill. Says it was a young woman matching the general description at her neighbor's house about 15 minutes ago. Now, the neighbor was gone, but this woman was watering the lawn for her. Did she talk to her? Yes, sir, she did. The woman didn't state her business, but she said she'd return at 10 o'clock. Why 10? Well, now, the woman on the phone, she told the suspect that's the time her neighbor would return home. Will she? Mrs. Kissinger, that's the neighbor, got home about five minutes ago. She wants to play it out. What she have in mind? A stakeout. She has a room we can watch from. <laughs> At the home of Edna Kissinger, we briefed her on the methods necessary for a successful stakeout. 10.35 a.m., an hour had passed. We waited. It yeah, looks like we've drawn a blank. Yeah, and our potential victim looks like she's getting a little nervous, doesn't she? Kissinger, I'm Betty Matthews from your local Red Cross chapter. Uh, you've been recommended as a possible volunteer. Oh? Oh, yes, I always help the Red Cross. Well, I wonder if this year you might like to help with our blood donor program. Would, would you like to volunteer?
4.10 p.m., we had contacted 16 of the 17 victims. Two were positive and 14 unsure that Evelyn Gentry had stolen from them. 4.30 p.m., the most recent victims, Chester and Martha Anderson, were contacted and asked to look at the mugshots. They were both positive that Evelyn Gentry was the suspect who had taken their money. 5.30 p.m., we returned to the office. <coughs> you two putting in some overtime, huh? Yes, sir, but right now we've run out of road. The Kissinger thing went nowhere. How'd the victims pan out? Well, four of them can positively ID the Gentry woman. And that's the end of the line. Best thing to do now is get an arrest warrant, file it in R&I. Maybe a radio car will stumble across her. If we can locate her and run a tail, even with our eyeball witnesses, the only thing that'll cinch a case is to grab her right after one's gone down. Yeah, but what's ideal and what's real are two different bags of fish. Right now, we gotta try to just get her off the street with a warrant. <laughs> Burglary Auto Green. Yeah, right here. I'll say this, this deal is sure making you popular. This Friday... Yes, ma'am. What'd she look like? What's that address? We'll be right out. A woman by the name of Bessie McDermott. She listened to Whitting Hill this morning. She says she was feeding her neighbor's cat when a woman matching Evelyn Gentry's description knocked on the neighbor's front door. The neighbor's an old man in the hospital, but the McDermott woman told the suspect he was at the doctor's office. Said she was trying to help. Sounded like she did. This Mrs. McDermott told the suspect the man would be back around 7 tonight. Yeah. Well, now, as far as she knows, the suspect is coming back. Ms. McDermott said we could use the old man's house. He'll okay it. Could be another wild goose chase. Maybe not, Captain. How's that? Suspect told Mrs. McDermott that she was sent out by an employment agency. 6.20 p.m. We arrived at the subject location in the Hollywood area and were met by Mrs. Bessie McDermott, the neighbor who was caring for the home of Andrew Jennings during his stay in a nearby hospital. I just love that Dick Whittingham, him and his story records. He's a riot. <laughs> well, anyway, I was listening to him this morning, and that's what gave me the idea. What idea was that, ma'am? That awful woman stealing from old people. When I answered the door and she said the employment agency sent her, I played it real cool, you know. Well, I said, Bessie, I said, let's us catch her in the act. So I told this woman, I didn't know whether he was looking for a day mate or not. I was just overfeeding the cat, you know. Well, that's what I told her. Yes, ma'am. Now, did this woman say she'd be back? Sure did. I told her Mr. Jennings would be home around 7. That's not really what did it. What's that, ma'am? I set her up real good for you, Sergeant. She asked me if Andrew was an invalid. I'm sure she spotted this wheelchair right here. I told her he was, and that a friend had taken him to the doctor. But here's the real clincher. Are you ready? Yeah, go ahead, ma'am. I told her that once a month, Andrew and his friend go out to dinner after Andrew gets his disability check cashed. Well, let me tell you, she lit up like a Christmas tree on Hollywood Boulevard. Do you recognize any of these women, Mrs. McDermott? Well, I'll sure give it a try. Uh-uh. Nope. No, that's not her. Uh-uh. Oh, this is the one, all right. That's her for sure. Evelyn Gentry. Oh, I want to see you men get that weasel. Six forty-five p.m. Bill and I prepared for the arrival of Evelyn Gentry. A decoy wallet with identified money was made ready. We agreed Bill would assume the role of Andrew Jennings, and I would cover from an adjoining room. Seven thirty p.m. The suspect was thirty minutes late. We waited. 7.50 p.m. The suspect had still not shown. I don't mind telling you, I'm beginning to feel old sitting in this wheelchair. Just hang in there, partner. we got to give it at least another hour. By that time, we'll be able to use my social security check for evidence. There's somebody coming up the walk. That's too dark to tell for sure, but we got a visitor. Come on in, Bessie. Well, I'm not Bessie, but I'll be happy to come in. Oh, I thought you were my neighbor, Bessie McDermott. She's got my cat, always feeds it when I'm out. Can I help you? I hope I can help you. I was sent out by the Apex Employment Agency. You wanted a day maid? Must be some mistake. I don't need a maid. I didn't talk to any employment agency. This is 1002 West Reddington Street, isn't it? That's the address, all right, but I still didn't call for anybody. Oh, there must be an awful mistake. This is where they sent me. Well, I'm sorry, miss. I can't understand it. Would you be so kind as to let me use your telephone? Oh, sure. Go right ahead. It's over there. Thank you so much. I won't be a minute. Hello? This is Miss Davis. 
Has Mr. Caldwell gone home? Oh, yes, I'll wait. Oh, hello, Mr. Caldwell. I'm glad I caught you. This job that you sent me on, the gentleman here indicates that he hasn't asked for a domestic. Yes, I have 1002 West Reddington. Oh, I see. Well, yes, all right. Thank you very much. You know, it was all a silly mistake, Mr... Mr... Jennings. Andrew Jennings. Mr. Jennings. I'm Ann Davis. Well, nice to know you, Miss Davis. The mistake is I'm supposed to be at 1002 East Reddington instead of West. Now, isn't that silly? Oh, I wouldn't say that. It's an understandable mistake. Oh, pardon me for staring. I was just thinking how lonely you must be, confined as you are. Well, I do a lot of reading and whatnot. I know what you mean, you poor dear. How long has it been? You mean being stuck in this contraption? Since the war, hand grenade. My, you're a veteran. Well, you've certainly given a lot for your country, haven't you? Oh, I can't complain. Uncle Sam's taken pretty good care of me. Well, if it was up to me, we'd reward our heroes with much more than we do. Oh, I can't rightly say I'm a hero, Miss Davis. Anne, call me Anne. You know, just sitting here makes me so proud. Well, it's nice of you to say so. This certainly is a nice house you have here, Andrew. Would you excuse me just a minute? I've got to get some water. Time for my pills. You'll do no such thing while I'm here. I'll get it for you. That's real nice of you. There's a glass in the kitchen there by the sink. I'll find it. You just sit right there and relax. Sure is nice having a woman around. You never know how much you miss a wife till she's gone. Of course, it's been a long time for me. I should be used to it by now. I understand. I'm just glad to help out. I wish I could afford a maid. I'd sure hire you. There you are. Thank you. Well, it sure has been nice talking with you, Andrew. Do you have to go already? I really must. The job, you know, and I am at the wrong address. Oh, that's right. Well, thank you for your kindness. Oh, you're entirely welcome, Andrew. You're a dear man. Goodbye. All right, hold it right there, lady police officers. You've really got your nerve, haven't you? Why not? You've had yours long enough. <laughs> seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On November 3rd, trial was held in Department 184, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The court found the suspect guilty of burglary in the second... Things infuriating. I wouldn't be surprised if it's impossible to work. I think they made these holes too small. What's the idea? How's it go? Well, it looks simple enough. The idea is to get these four little ball bearings into these four very little small holes. Simple as pie. Well, maybe all it takes is a steady hand. My hand's steady enough, Joe. They just went and made those holes too small. There's two of them. And there's number three. You did? Whoops. Sure, whoops. That's the tough one, number four. There she goes. There's all four of them, first, second, third, and home. Must be the old nerves. They're all frayed. No, thanks. You keep it. Well, don't you want to beat it? You beat it, Joe. I'd rather think it was my shattered nerves. Burglary Friday. Yes, that's right. What's that address? I see. Well, what's missing? Oh. Yes, ma'am, I understand. All right, we'll be right out. Over on West Garfield, a woman had her entire house cleaned out. Yeah. A blind woman. Whoever did it even took her cane. 1.45 p.m. We left the office and drove over to 2358 West Garfield. You the police? Yes, ma'am, that's right. This is Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. Oh, it's terrible. I just can't believe it. I simply can't believe it. He didn't leave her a thing. Nothing. Can you believe it? He even took her cane. I got a stick. I got a stick. Now, this he you keep talking about, do you know who he is? My husband, Mr. Daniel Loomis. Loomis. He even cleaned out your kitchen, too, didn't he? Refrigerator, stove. Your husband's the devil incarnate. Yes, Grandma, I know. I know. 
The devil. Look under rocks. You'll find him. She's my grandmother, Mrs. Candell. Mr. Loomis came over to sit with her to keep her company. He's a snake. I always said so. I said so from the first time I met him. Soft, sweaty hands. Such a divine pleasure to make your acquaintance, Mrs. Candell. He even hissed like a snake. Look under rocks. I wonder if we could have a description. I'll give you a description. A forked tongue, little beady eyes, and he slithers on his belly. You'll find him easy. Just look under rocks. Yes, ma'am. wanted a description? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Loomis is 38. He's six feet tall. He has sandy hair. His eyes... His eyes are brown. They're very sweet. Very soft. Yes, ma'am. Any marks or scars? Uh, is, is a tattoo a mark? Yes, ma'am. Does he have one? On his right arm. Could you describe it? It's a heart with his name written inside it. His name? Yes, Mr. Daniel Loomis. You mean Daniel Loomis? No, Mr. Daniel Loomis. The word Mr. is tattooed on his arm? Everyone called him Mr. Daniel Loomis. He insisted on it. A matter of respect, he said. Even I had to call him Mr. Except, well, you know, when we were alone. Now, do you have any idea why he did this? My mother and my aunt generally keep Granny company, but today they had to go shopping downtown, so they asked Mr. Loomis to stay with her. He came over about nine this morning. Does he have a job? He's between jobs. It's going on a year now. No, he left this morning, and that was the last you've seen of him. Is that right? I came over on my lunch hour. I work just a few blocks away. I'm a bookkeeper at Trundles. I found the house the way you saw it, cleaned out. Grandma was just standing in the corner when I came. With everything gone that way, she didn't know where to move. Blind people rely somewhat on reference points. When they're taken away, they're lost. She was just standing there in the corner crying. I found the box out back for her to sit on. He took everything, even the money she had hidden in her cookie jar. She'd saved about $30. He took the cookie jar, too. I see. Now, what else did he take? Nothing very valuable, if that's what you mean. Just everything she had. Pictures, keepsakes, mementos. Things even a blind woman can see. I better be getting back to her. I know she's frightened. You'll let us know. Yes, ma'am. We'll be in touch with you. Thank you kindly. You know, Joe, women are funny. How's that? This creep Loomis pulls a stunt like this, and his wife describes his eyes as soft and sweet. Sounds like the grandmother's description's a little closer to the truth, doesn't it? Two twenty p.m. We return to Parker Center to run a check on Daniel Loomis. Our is running to make on Loomis. Should call any minute. Friday, pick up two. Thanks. It's Friday. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Daniel Loomis. Right. Uh huh. What was the guy's name? Right, thank you very much. Bad paper. Loomis skipped bail while he was waiting for trial about two years ago. Apparently, he uses that trademark all the time. What's that? He signed all the checks, mister. Is that right? And the man who put up his bond was a fellow by the name of Chester Albertson. He owns a bowling alley over on Western. Friend is? Ex-friend, more than likely. When Loomis skipped out on his bail, he left Albertson holding a bag for the $5,000 bond. This guy's really beautiful, isn't he? Yeah. Like shaking hands with a violin spider. 3.15 p.m. We arrived at the Rollaway Alleys at 4211 Southwestern. You Chester Albertson? I'm 41 across. Oh, I'm Chester Albertson. Right, can I help you? We're police officers. This is Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. It's got to do with Melchick, right? Listen, friend, I told that Melchick 20 times, no hustling. I told him, plain out, no gambling. Every time he comes around here, he's got another sucker on the string. Well, this last time was a hare that broke this camel's back. I tossed him out on his barf. I told him, I says, Melchick, I hate to do this, but if you think I'm going to take the chance of losing my license for a no-good-for-nothing bum like you, you're wrong. So I tossed him. I pay my rent, I pay my taxes, so that gives me a right, right? So what's his gripe? We're not here about that. It's Daniel Loomis we want to know about. You guaranteed his bail two years ago, isn't that right? Don't remind me. What a world. Milchick gives me heartburn and Mr. Daniel Loomis gives me ulcers. Loomis was a friend of yours? Listen, friend, when a fox eats a chicken, do you go around asking if they were buddies? 
friend Loomis gobbled me up. Gizzard, feathers, the whole works. How well did you know Loomis? He was a regular. Used to come in and bowl three or four lines several nights a week. We used to have a couple of beers and jaw a while when he finished. Good bowler. He had this great hook. You'd think each time he was pitching a gutter ball, but at the last second it took this crazy twist and pow, right in the pocket. How long did you know him? A little over a year, I guess. Why'd you put up his bail? Like I say, he was a regular. Anyone can be bum-wrapped, and he was like a friend, and it seemed like the friendly thing to do. What do you know about him? Well, after I got him bailed out, he moved in with me, just to give him a chance to get back on his feet. He seemed like a right guy, not a slob like some of the clowns you meet these days. A nice, soft-spoken, educated kind of guy. He went to church regular. I don't go, you understand, but I kind of like other people to go. I think they get something out of it. But this Loomis creep, the only thing he ever got out of church was whatever he pinched from the collection tray. I mean, let's face it, he was strictly B.N. B.N.? Bad news. But how can you guess? Especially me, I'm a trusting guy. Spell that J-E-R-K. We agreed to go 50-50 on the apartment. In fact, he insisted. So I give Loomis cash, and he pays the rent, phone, and utility bills. How dumb can I be, right? The guy's up on a bum check wrap, and I'm paying him cash. Sure enough, all that paper comes bouncing back to my front door. By that time, Loomis has moved on. So is my camera, my stereo rig, my three good suits, my TV set. The crumb even heists my bowling trophies. What kind of work did Loomis do? You got me. I always figured him for some kind of salesman. He was a very nice talker, very smooth. He didn't talk so much about himself, though, mostly politics and sports, stuff like that. Do you ever talk about his wife? His ex, I guess you mean. His ex-wife? Yeah, Maxine. He mentioned her a couple times. When he got a few beers in him, he'd talk about moving back to Penley, Ohio, and getting married up with Maxine again. But it was just beer talk. He never mentioned Penley or the Broad when he was sober. You know, when the liquor's in, the truth is out. You ever mention any other relatives? <laughs> yeah, a brother is. Name of Charlie. <laughs> he sure hated Charlie. He used to cuss him out with words I never even heard of. You know where this Charlie lives? Sure, Kingford, New Jersey. I even talked to Charlie. When Daniel took the powder, I called up Charlie on the phone. I thought maybe he'd want to do the right thing by me. You know, sometimes brothers feel responsible for each other, family reputation and so forth. What did he say when you called him? Well, I introduced myself, Chester Albertson, and explained the circumstances. And friend, when I got all finished with my spiel, you'll never guess what he said. What did he say? First he laughed, only it wasn't exactly a laugh. And then he said, welcome to the club. Did he say anything else? Nope. Then he hanged up. Can you beat that? Four ten p.m. We return to Parker Satter. I concluded a long-distance call to Charlie Loomis in Kingford, New Jersey. Bill called Maxine Loomis in Pinley, Ohio. This Daniel Loomis can't be real. The more I hear about him, the more I figure he's just a figment of someone's imagination. What'd you get from his ex-wife? For openers, it's not his ex-wife. As far as she knows, she's still Mrs. Mr. Daniel Loomis. One day, about three years ago, she came home, told him they were expecting a baby. Sometime during the night, he packed his bags, and she hasn't heard from him since. What's his brother have to say about him? Well, he hasn't seen Loomis since February 8th, 1964. Now, he remembers the date real well because that was the day after their mother died. It seems that Daniel ran away with the funeral funds. You know, after a while in this work, you think you've met them all. Yeah, you do. I've been on the job 19 years, Joe, and for sure goal, I think this boy wins the prize. Burglary Friday. Right. Yes, ma'am, I see. When? What was that address? Right, I have it. Thank you. That was the second Mrs. Loomis. Yeah? In the mail today, she received her canceled checks from the bank. One of the checks was a deposit for an apartment over on West Cypress. The check was signed... Mr. Daniel Loomis. Maybe we got a break. I was beginning to think the girl's grandmother was going to be right after all. How's that? I was about ready to start looking under rocks. <laughs> officers. This is Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. I'm Amanda Tucker. What's wrong? Do you have a tenant here named Daniel Loomis? He paid his deposit, but he hasn't moved in yet. And if my prayers are answered, he'll never move in. Why do you say that? First, you tell me why you're looking for him. Routine investigation. Sure. Come on in. When my daughter gets home, maybe she can tell you what you want to know. Your daughter's a friend of his, is she? With Mr. Loomis as a friend, I suspect you don't need enemies. Yes, my daughter is a friend of Mr. Loomis's. A mother doesn't have enough to worry about without Mr. Loomis's popping up. When will your daughter be home? Oh, any minute now. I sure hope you're going to arrest Mr. Loomis. You sound like you don't like him very much. You could put it that way. 
The truth of the matter is I hate him. Why are you renting an apartment to him? The same reason I hate him. Because of Doris. Doris? My daughter. What's she have to do with it? They're engaged, her and Mr. Loomis. Oh, come on, tell me. What do you want him for? How many wives has he murdered for their insurance money? What makes you think that? Because he smells bad. How's that? I don't mean he needs a bath. A mother's nose. You know how a fish stinks when it's gone bad? Well, that's how Mr. Loomis smells to me. Do you have anything else besides that to go on? You gentlemen need more. I trust my nose. Why would he want to marry Doris? Ma'am? You tell me why Mr. Loomis, so suave, so sophisticated, so well-educated, wants to marry my Doris. I'm not sure we follow you. Listen, don't misunderstand. I want Doris to be happy. I want to see her married with a family of her own. I love her, but I'm her mother. Mothers love their children, but what does Mr. Loomis see in her? Please tell me that. I wouldn't know, ma'am. She's not pretty. She's plain. She's homely. Homely and heavy. Mr. Loomis is no Prince Charming. But if all the boys in the neighborhood can do better than Doris, why not a hotshot like Loomis? She's not very bright. She can't cook. She doesn't like to keep house. She can't sew on a button, even. When it comes to dancing, she's got two left feet. I love her. But what could a man see in Doris? I say nothing. When are they planning to get married? Next month. They've opened a joint honeymoon fund at the bank. They're supposed to take a trip to Hawaii. Hawaii. If you ask me, it's a waste of money. How do you mean? What's in Hawaii? They got pineapples. So is the supermarket. They got a beach. So has Santa Monica. Well, what else? The hula? <laughs> the only way Doris could do the hula would be if she stood still and the earth shook. Either of you gentlemen single? He is. You'll like Doris. Oh, that must be her. Doris! Meet Sergeant Friday and Officer Gannon. They're policemen. They've come to arrest your Mr. Loomis. What? Aren't you going to arrest him? We'd like to ask him some questions. Oh, that's what they always say when they're going to arrest someone. What do you want with him? He hasn't done anything. Don't get excited, Doris. You don't want to be guilty of shielding a dangerous criminal. These gentlemen are only doing their duty. What's this all about? Do you know where we can get in touch with Daniel Loomis? What if I do? Then we want you to tell us. What do you think he's done? Well, to start with, he's married. Twice. A bigamist. At least he doesn't murder them. Mother, I don't believe you. It's true, Miss Tucker. If you're a couple of Daniel's friends playing a joke, I want you to know that I don't think you're very funny. No, it's not a joke, Miss Tucker. I'm sorry. I suppose I should have guessed. Why should someone like Daniel want someone like me? But he did want me. He asked me to marry him. I met him three months ago at the County Art Museum, and just two weeks later he proposed. If he didn't love me... Why would he ask me to be his wife? This joint honeymoon fund that you have at the bank. Now tell us, was that his idea? Honeymoon? You don't mean he'd do all that to me just for... Oh, no! 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 Sometimes you're right about something. Someone. And you'd give your eyes to be wrong. Poor Doris. A mother's nose. I wish I could sniff out happiness for her instead of all the time calamities and disappointments. It's like predicting the end of the world, and the next day it blows up. You can't take much satisfaction in being right. All right. All right. How can I help you? Can you tell us where we can find Loomis? He was supposed to take me to a movie tonight, but not until about 8 o'clock. He's probably bowling. He bowls over that place near Clayton, near the shopping center. Glass, I suppose. Is it glass? I'm no judge. Neither am I. Not of anything. And all this time, I've been thinking he was too good for her. Mother, does that make me? 5.20 p.m. We arrived at Anson's bowling lanes. We recognized Loomis from his description. Are you Daniel Loomis? I'm Mr. Daniel Loomis. Who are you? I'm Mr. Officer Gannon. This is Mr. Sergeant Friday. Police. That's right. Well, now, what do you want with me? Oh, Loomis, we hardly know where to begin. Burglary, forgery, bigamy. Oh, yeah, well, I can explain all that. You mind holding this? You're doing just fine. I'm bowling a three-game series. Got another game to go. No, you got no more games to go. But I'm going for a 600 series. No, you're going downtown. You're under arrest. 
Gentlemen, when I finish explaining matters to you, you will not only let me go, but you will apologize for interrupting my three-game series. Is that right? I promise you that. Yeah, well, we know what that's worth, don't we? 5.45 p.m. We took the suspect downtown and booked him. Bill advised him of his constitutional rights. Are you sure you understand your rights? Now, how many times do you tend to ask me that stupid question? As often as it takes to get an answer. I have very patiently explained to you, gentlemen, that I am well aware of my rights to counsel, to remain silent, etc. I have also tried to make you understand I consider those rights safeguards for criminals, not for innocent men such as myself. I have nothing to fear from the truth. In my particular case, gentlemen, truth is the best defense. Now then, you have questions to ask me. You do have questions to ask me, haven't you? That's right, we do, Loomis. That's Mr. Loomis, Sergeant. Considering the extent to which I'm willing to go to be cooperative, I don't think a little respect, a little common courtesy is too much to expect from a public servant. All right, you. Now let's go way back. You want to explain? You try explaining why you copped your mother's funeral money. My mother's funeral money. It does sound a bit callous, doesn't it? Just a little around the edges. Well, things often do until you know all the facts. I took that money because it was the only way I could make certain of getting something out of the estate. Our brother Charlie was mother's pet, and I had reason to suspect she had written me out of the will. I wasn't guessing, gentlemen. She told me a week before she died that she had written me out. What would you have done? I can assure you that my mother's passing over to the other side brought my dear brother far more than the $950 I managed to salvage. You want to tell us about a Mrs. Loomis in Pinley, Ohio? Oh, sweet girl. I only left it because she became pregnant. Wasn't in our plans. In your plans? Oh, I couldn't afford it. She would have had to stop working. And I simply wasn't up to that sort of financial responsibility. Officer again, and I sympathize with your displeasure. And I don't claim to be a saint. But then the saint doesn't have to worry about trying to support a family he can't afford, does he? I suppose you have an excuse for forgery. You can choose to call it an excuse if you wish. I'd prefer to say I had my reasons. Such as? A combination. One, I am cursed with a taste. Make that an appetite for the finer things in life. I enjoy French cuisine, and I dare boast that I can read a wine list the way most people read the alphabet. Unfortunately, I haven't the knack for earning great sums of money. You know, it's a misery of this century that so few of the people who have the fortunes have the taste and genius to know how to appreciate the things money can buy. I don't deny I passed bad checks, but in my defense, I had the very best of reasons. I can assure you none of those ill-gotten dollars were wasted on the necessities of life. They were spent only on the luxuries. Why did you marry a second time without getting a divorce from your first wife? Divorce is the business of lawyers. It's an expensive nuisance to the rest of us. The Janice was terribly anxious to get married. Now I ask you, if marrying me could make Janice happy, and getting a divorce could only make Maxine unhappy, could I take a more honorable course than the one I took? What about Doris Tucker? Oh, I still plan to marry Doris Tucker. As a matter of fact, we have a date tonight, and I can still make it if you have too many more questions. What about the honeymoon fund? Uh, what about it? You didn't plan to put it in your pocket? Oh, I didn't say that. I said I intended to marry Doris Tucker. I don't plan to grow old with her. You saw her, a terribly dull, unattractive girl. Sweet in her way, but hardly anyone's romantic daydream. It would make her happy to marry me and go through life known as Doris Loomis, the woman whose husband once disappeared, rather than Doris Tucker, the girl who wasn't even asked. Now, for that favor, and for having dated her these past couple of months... I don't think the honeymoon fund is an unreasonable compensation. All right, Loomis, I have just one more question for you. Well, I think I can guess what it is, but you ask it. This morning, a blind old lady had her house cleaned out. Now, would you know anything about that? Obviously, I did it. Again, to the undiscerning, a clear-cut case of arch villainy. I called up a moving van, told them my old aunt had passed on, and the family had decided to put her things in storage. They did a good, fast job. Of course, there wasn't that much. It's a small house. I sat with Granny in the backyard. Now they finished that job in less than an hour. I do admire efficiency. What did you plan to do with her things? Pawn some, sell the rest at auction. Why'd you do it? Well, I need the money. Besides, she's a nasty old woman, foul-mouthed and ugly. Anywhere children would see to it that she didn't starve, she'd have a place to sleep. What more does the old crone need? That serves him right. It serves who right and for what? It serves him all right for asking Mr. Daniel Loomis to waste his time babysitting with the old witch. One last question. Yes. 
What's this thing you have about being called mister? This thing, as you put it, is simple enough to explain. When I was in the Navy, I was an ordinary seaman. And it galled me that I had to call illiterates who weren't worth a fraction of my value mister. Simply because they had the connections and family influence to become officers. Well, I made a vow then and there that in civilian life, I would always be called mister. Well, now it's going to be a little rough on you from here on in, isn't it? How's that, Friday? Well, where you're headed, there aren't any misters. That's so? Just numbers. The story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On October 19th, trial was held in Department 183, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that... ...you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. upset about skipper this is the third time she's called since i checked in this morning i couldn't get a word in i have no idea what the screaming's all about hop out there and see if you can straighten it out name's ethel gower yes sir what's this little sisters that's right gower woman runs a bar out in south atlantic yes sir sounds more like the command post for world war three we pulled out of the police garage and headed for south atlantic boulevard 3.17 p.m., we arrived at Mrs. Gower's place. What'll it be, boys? You're Mrs. Gower? That's me. Police officers, this is Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. Where's Captain Fremont? Well, that's what we'd like to know, Miss Gower. You gonna tell me there ain't no Captain Fremont on the force? That's right, there isn't. Well, I should have figured you'd be on his payroll, too. When are you cops gonna stop covering for him? We're not covering for anybody, Miss Gower. We'd just like to ask you a few questions. Send that other plainclothesman over. He's the cop I want to talk to. What other plainclothesman? Look, I know the whole force is in on this con, so why don't you stop making like you don't know nothing about the nail? The what? The nail. The con game you cops are working. Now, just a minute, Mrs. Gower. We're not here to con you. We're here to try and help you. Help me? That's a laugh. Help yourselves, you mean. You're all scared to death. I'm going to blow the whistle on your sweet little racket after what I told that desk sergeant. What desk sergeant? The one that booked me. You know I'm out on bail. Now, why don't you tell us the whole story right from the beginning? I was cheated out of my share of the nail courtesy treatment. And I ain't sitting still for it. I'm going to write the mayor, the governor, and the attorney general. Cops or no cops, I ain't getting beat out on no 35 bucks. Who cheated you out of that money, Mrs. Gower? As if you didn't know. Well, tell us who it was. You play dumb if you want to. You cops is gonna sweat by the time I get done with you. All right now, Mrs. Gower, no more threats. You registered a complaint and we're here to straighten it out. Now, are you gonna cooperate with us or aren't you? Don't lean on me, buster. Little sister, don't scare. We're not trying to scare you, ma'am. We're just trying to find out what this is all about. Suppose you start by telling us how you were cheated. How I was cheated? Just look at me. I was cheated the day I was born. Ever since the doctor picked me up and slapped me, I've been whacked around by men. But me hit one guy, and it's in the can for me. I tell you, it ain't fair. I even get hustled by a cop. Which cop? The plain clothes guy, the sergeant that works for Captain Fremont. But what's this sergeant's name? Here. It's on all the receipts. Sergeant Preston C. Densmore. Well, did this man tell you he's with the department? He works for Captain Fremont at the nail. You know him. We don't know Fremont, Densmore, or this nail thing you keep talking about. Here, read this and tell me you don't know what it is. This certifies Ethel Gower as a friend of the National Association for Law Enforcement and as a contributor to the Nail Widows and Orphans Fund is entitled to all courtesy and special privileges. You were hereby ordered to extend same to this friend of Nail, signed Paul G. Fremont, Captain Los Angeles Branch, Nail. 
And check that address, 150 North Los Angeles Street. That's the police department's address, but nobody's authorized to issue cards like that. You're telling me it's no good? No, ma'am, it's no good. Then how come Axel Varney's got the same exact card and it works for him? Axel Varney? The shoemaker next door. I'll get him in here to prove it to you. didn't even take out as big an ad as me and his card works like a dream and the first time I use mine I wind up in a bucket well now what's all that about you taking out an ad Mrs. Gower you know what one the nail magazine Sergeant Densmore sells the ads for you all read it it comes out every month is that what you gave him the $35 for an ad sure little sister serves big drinks you seen it didn't you we've never seen the magazine well I seen it Densmore showed me a copy Every one of you supposed to get it. That's what this Densmore told you, did he? Yeah. And for the ad, I got a courtesy card. <laughs> Some courtesy for shoemakers, maybe, not for lady tavern keepers. You call me, little sister? These boys are cops. Tell them about your nail card, Axe. Oh, sure. Carry with me at all times. Works like a charm. Thank you. But before I bought that little ad for your widows and orphans fun, I had a lot of trouble. What kind of trouble, Mr. Varney? Well, driving to Caliente for the races every Sunday, I'd always get one or two traffic tickets. Has this card been honored by police officers? Oh, works like a charm. See what I tell you. Who honored the card, Mr. Varney? Mexican authorities or American? Oh, I never get no tickets in Mexico, only here. Since I got that card, I've had five moving violations, four, maybe five parking tickets. Did the arresting officers extend any special privileges when you showed them this card? Oh, I didn't ever show it to them. Well, then why do you say it works? Well, Sergeant Dinsmore, he told me what to do. He said, whenever I get tickets, just tear them up. See? How long have you been doing this, Mr. Barney? Oh, about five months now. Just tear them up. That's the beauty of that courtesy card. You've been contacted by the police about those tickets? Oh, I got a couple of letters. Just tore them up, too. No sweat, no trouble. Let me give you some advice, Mr. Varney. What's that? Next time you get a letter, it'd be a good idea to answer it. and checked out Sergeant Preston Densmore. There was no record of anyone with that name in either the personnel or CII files. The nail scam looked like a petty scheme, but it was injurious to the department as well as to the public. If a police force is to function effectively, it must not be held in suspicion by the community. Well, that'll do it, Joe. We'll have Axel Varney's nail card in a few hours. Oh, how's that? Had R and I check him out. There are four misdemeanor traffic warrants out for him already. Yeah. He's got a total bail tab of over 200 bucks. Gave all the dope to watch Commander at University Division. Looks like that Gower woman never did believe you. Now what, Captain? She's been calling the chief's office. They say she sounds like a nice, endearing lady. Yeah, about as nice and endearing as a scream from the dentist's office. Look, Joe, you or Bill work up a 15-7 layout this whole bunk. I'd like every patrolman, every watch commander to be alerted. See how many of those bunk cards are floating around town and under what circumstances a holder's parted with their money. Yes, sir. How about talking to Dan Cook, Captain? Break some kind of story in the papers, TV. All right, see what he can do. You take care of the 15-7, I'll talk to Dan, huh? I'd like to have that report by quitting time. I promised Eileen I'd be home on time tonight, Captain. We were going to celebrate. Celebrate what? That I got home on time. <laughs> Saturday, November 17th, 9.50 a.m. We had Varney's fake courtesy card surrendered to the arresting officers. We also had another victim of the bunko, a businessman named Wesley Hundorn. Yes, sir, it's just like mine. The same card. And you say you lost yours? Lost? Misplaced? Well, I saw that little squib in this morning's paper. It rang a bell, and I thought I should call on you, gentlemen. I'm a public-spirited citizen. Well, we thank you, Mr. Hundorn. Now, can you tell us why you were issued that card and by whom? Gladly. I first got a call at Wesley Hundorn's World. Wesley Hundorn's World? That's my place of business, a travel agency. Yes, sir. Captain Fremont told me if I were to advertise in the nail publication, I might get all your charters. What charters? Charter flights. Hawaii, Europe, tours for nail members. But if there is no such organization, I guess that explains it. Explains what, sir? Why I never got any business from you. Yes, sir. All you got was that card. I never had any intention of using the card. I want that understood, officers. I don't believe in special privileges. When did this Captain Fremont call on you, Mr. Hundorn? Last July 12th. All right, can you describe him for us? We never met vis-a-vis. -vis. We spoke on the telephone. Did you mail your check to him? No, a sergeant came by. Was the sergeant in uniform? Same uniform you gentlemen wear. An off-the-rack suit and shiny shoes. Sergeant Preston C. Densmore. 
I have his receipt and my canceled check right here. It's uh, made out to the National Association for Law Enforcement, endorsed by Captain Paul G. Fremont. Thank you. $250. I took a full page. Would you like to see the ad? You have it with you? Yes. You may keep that if you like. We sure would. And then my coming here was of some value to you, gentlemen? Very valuable. Thank you, sir. No, no. I don't want any thanks. As I told you, I'm a public-spirited citizen. But there is one thing you might do. Yes, sir, and what's that? I'm afraid I overparked. I'm down on Main Street. Sorry, Mr. Hondoran. We can't do anything about that. Oh, come now. You can fix a little parking ticket. Well, now, I thought you said you didn't believe in special privileges, Hondoran. I don't. But I helped you, didn't I? Yes, sir. Doesn't one good turn deserve another? All right, we'll do you a good turn. And what's that? We'll try to run Captain Fremont out of Wesley Hondoran's world. Wesley Hundorn's copy of the Nail magazine provided us with a solid lead. A line in the masthead stated that the publication was printed by the Cabo Press of Los Angeles. They were open half days on Saturdays. It was 10.15 a.m. The address was a six-minute drive from Parker Center. Well, it's about time some officers showed up. But you better have the cash this time. Cash for what, Mr. Cabo? Well, the books. You are from Fremont, aren't you? No, sir. We're from Fraud's Division, Bunko Section, LAPD. Oh, I thought at last Fremont was going to make good and pick up the books. What books? Nail notes, like that magazine you got there. I'm holding 1,500 copies in the back. Well, what do you men want? We want Captain Fremont, Mr. Cable. Oh, so do I, but why do you come to me? Well, you printed this, didn't you? Yes, sir, three issues. He paid cash for the first one, then he gave me a check for the second one. Just a moment, I'll show you. A rubber check for $750 that bounced 750 feet. I'm still waiting for him to make good on this before he gets that third issue out there. Well, this dated last August. Well, Fremont said he'd make it good, so I went ahead and ran off the third issue, but he never came by for it. Did you attempt to contact him? Well, a man doesn't like to bother the police. I know you're busy people. Did you also print the cards? Cards? Nail courtesy cards. No, just the book. 500 copies the first issue, 1,000, then 1,500 this last one. Well, did you do business with Fremont direct? Yes, sir. Could you describe him for us? Oh, he's a man about 45, 50 years, around six foot tall, bald head. He looks like a police chief or an army officer. Well, isn't that him? We don't know. We've never seen him. Really? He seems to be a nice guy. You'd like him. I doubt it. Eleven twelve a.m. We drove to the West Valley address Captain Fremont had given Mr. Cabo as his residence. One eight. 865 Willa Vista Way. It was an empty lot. Monday, November 19th, 8.50 a.m. The weather turned cool over the weekend. I'd gotten a flat tire on the way in and had to change wheels. Bill was at work on time. Good afternoon, Sergeant. Glad you could drop in. If you ever change a tire on the freeway at rush hour, I'm lucky to be alive. Keep your coat on. The freeway's gonna get another crack at you. Yeah, what's this? A new nail member just called in. Freeway traffic was still heavy as we headed for the Crest Retirement Home in Hollywood. Mrs. Jennifer Salt was the name of the nail contributor who had telephoned. She mentioned that she was 68 years old. Are you Mrs. Salt? Yes. We're police officers, ma'am. This is Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. Are you men from nail? No, ma'am. We're from the Los Angeles Police Department. You spoke to me over the phone a little while ago. Oh, yes. For a moment, I had hopes. You had hopes? Poor Victor. I'm the only one he has left. And who's that, ma'am? My grandson, Victor. Everyone else has forgotten him except me. We write to each other constantly. You see, he depends upon me. But it's so difficult for me to accomplish anything by myself these days. That's why I was so pleased to purchase an ad in the Nail Monthly. Do you have a copy of the magazine, Mrs. Salt? No, I never received it. But periodicals do get misplaced in the mails. How much did your ad cost you, ma'am? $350 for the entire back cover. And were you given a receipt? Oh, yes. I have it here. Thank you. How did this Sergeant Preston Dansmore contact you? I was here in the lobby the day he came to sell the rest home an ad. Did the rest home buy an ad? 
No, I was the only one here who did. Well, now, did this Sergeant Densmore give you a courtesy card? Oh, yes. That was why I purchased the ad. wonder if we could see the card, ma'am. Well, I'm sorry. You must have misunderstood. The card wasn't for me. It was for Victor. I took the ad out in his name. Does Victor have the card now, Mrs. Salt? Oh, yes. Sergeant Densmore assured me that if Victor presented the nail card to the authorities, they would extend him extra privileges. Well, what do you mean, privileges? Victor's at Chino. He's in prison. <laughs> Assault, we received a radio communication informing us that an officer, Reed, from Central Division was waiting to talk to us. The message was that it was urgent. We rushed back to the office. This is Bart Emerson, Sergeant. I pulled him over at 5th and Grand for running a light. He tore up the ticket, so I brought him in. I feel like a fool, Sergeant. I was told I could tear up that ticket. And I explained that nail card's no good. How'd you get the card, Mr. Emerson? From Sergeant Densmore. I took out this ad in the book. Mr. Emerson says he has an appointment with his Sergeant Densmore today. How's that? He's coming to my place to pick up a check for another ad. Yeah, what time? 11, 11, 15. Where is your place of business, Mr. Emerson? I subcontract a fleet of skip loggers. We're on that job out at Lancashire, and I keep a temporary office there. If you don't need me anymore, Sergeant, I better get back on the air. Right, thanks, Reed. You know something, Sergeant? What's that? I feel like an idiot. <laughs> Emerson on the procedure we wanted to follow, he left. Thirty minutes later, dressed in soft clothes, we drove out to his job site. Bill would pose as a construction workman. To witness the conversation I hoped to have with Sergeant Preston C. Densmore when he arrived. 11.30 a.m. We'd been waiting for the suspect for almost an hour. 11.34 a.m. A 67 beige Chrysler convertible pulled up outside the construction shack. Our plan went into effect as soon as he stepped inside. Howdy, Emerson. Hi, Sergeant. I gotta run over the hill. Some of my equipment's lost up. This is Joe Frazier here, a friend of mine. He'll keep you company till I get back. Howdy, Joe. Joe, this is Sergeant Densmore. I was telling you about him. Oh, yeah. You're with the L.A. Police, is that right? That's right, partner. I'll stay by the phone in case that McCormick job calls. Yeah, I'll tell him I'll be over there about noon. Right, boss. Stick around, Sergeant. I'll be right back. Talk to Joe here. He's subbing the heavy equipment on this job. So you're subbing the big stuff, huh, partner? That's right. Are you the officer that gave Emerson that card? You mean the nail courtesy card? Is that what you call it? Yeah. Sure you are. That's my department ID, and that's the nail card. National Association for Law Enforcement. We all belong to it. You know, I wouldn't mind having one of those myself if they work the way Emerson says they do. Boss says they work great. Well, of course they do, partner. We and police work have reciprocal agreements all over the nation. Wherever you go, friends of Nail are treated with big courtesy. How do I go about getting a card? Well, it's just by cooperating with our organization. Well, how's that? By advertising in our magazine, Nail Notes. It's a national periodical, circulated to and read by every peace officer in the nation. Must be a big magazine. It's one of the advantages of advertising, partner. Our circulation is looking right at a quarter of a million a month. You print that many, do you? You bet you. The magazine is the only source of revenue for our widows and orphans fund. You mean the money from the ads? Your ad is a contribution to help support widows and orphans of all police officers who gave their lives in line of duty. Yeah, that's all right. How much does an ad cost? That's up to you, partner. The smallest ad is $20. Full page is two fifty, and the back cover is three fifty. Well, how much do I have to pop for to get one of those uh, cards? As a friend of the police, we measure your sincerity, not your wallet, partner. Just keep in mind that all contributions to Nail go to our widows and orphans. Now, what should we write you up for? Full page? Well, let's see. I got about two hundred and twenty bucks on me. That's fine. Uh, there's a discount for cash. You get thirty bucks off on the full page. Now, what do you want to say in your end? Oh, how about just good luck from a friend? Well, now, that's real nice, partner. You are a sincere friend of the police. Here's your receipt. Thank you. Okay, what about the nail card? Coming right up. Signed by Captain Fremont himself. You just fill in your own name here on this line. Okay. No money, partner. All right. There you go. 
Thank you very much. Police officer Stansmore, you're under arrest for attempted grand theft bunco. Oh, boy, oh, boy. I knew it. Knew what? A bust was brewing. Sooner or later, I had to get clobbered. It's our duty to advise you. You have the right to remain silent. You have the right to presence of an attorney. If you desire one, cannot afford an attorney. One will be appointed before any questioning. You understand that? I've heard it before. Do you understand it, fella? Yeah, and I don't get uptight, partner. I'm just small potatoes. But I'll take you to the big man if you treat me nice. You know better than that, Densmore. Oh, all I got is 10% of the action. Give me a break. Sure, just like you give people with this cheap, sleazy con of yours. It wasn't my idea. Yeah, sure. Now, now, now listen, boys. You treat me right, and I can take you to the boiler room right now. You can toss a net on Fremont and the whole operation. It's his bit, not mine. No deal, Densmore. You're going to settle for one stinking card when I'm offering to stack the whole deck for you? If we have to. But if you want a level, we'll go this far. When you come up for sentencing, we'll get a letter to the judge explaining what you did, if you do anything, and if you helped. We can't guarantee how it'll affect his decision. Now, that's all we'll do, Densmore. Clear? As glass, partner. suspect to an old rundown house at 6020 North Adams Avenue in West Los Angeles. Densmore took us into the living room where telephone solicitors were busily at work. Mr. Goldring, this is Captain Fremont of the Los Angeles Police. No, nothing's wrong, sir, but it'll pay you to listen to what I have to say. Is he Fremont? I ain't here. Everybody's Fremont, but that's himself. Can just anybody walk in here? With the key, yeah. The old hands are always bringing in new faces. Most phone hustlers are floaters. They work a few hours, drift out. We're two men short now. Hey, Paul, you got a minute? These men want on? Yeah. Are you Fremont? That's right. But on the horns, you're Captain Fremont. Ever work a boiler room before? San Francisco, Seattle, Chicago. You? Worked with him in Frisco. Mm. Good voices, both of you. Okay. I pay three bucks an hour, five percent of all the action, Ben's more closes for you. Grab yourselves a line, start getting rich. What's this? Prospects. Give me a couple of those sheets, will you? Before you crank up your first one, study this pitch. We read this. Any objections? No. I get a kick out of you, Drift, as you come into an operation call and think you can handle it right away. Took me a long time to work up that sheet, and it's a winner, so stick with it word for word until you start swinging with the idea. When you think you're ready, I'll monitor your first couple of pitches. Got it? Police officers, you're under arrest for grand theft. All of you, cradle those phones, line up over here. Get those hands behind your head. Hold it, mister. Don't make me stop you the hard way. What do you think you're doing? You can't bust me like this. I'll call another unit. Not on my phone, you don't. Those phones cost money, boy. Here's two bits. Keep the change for your Widows and Orphans Fund. The story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On January 10th, trial was held in Department 183, Superior Court of the State of California, for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspects were found guilty of grand theft. Grand theft is punishable by imprisonment in the county jail for not more than one year, or in the state prison for not more than ten years. suspects were tried and found guilty of impersonating police officers and of the sale of membership